Good morning, Ms. Richards. Can I have counsel for the state make their appearance, please? Yes, Your Honor. Patricia Cassell for the state. Your Honor, Brad Bloodworth for the state. Joseph Hill on behalf of the state. Mark Olson. Welcome. Thank you. On behalf of Ms. Richards, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Sky Lazaro on behalf of Ms. Richards. Aaron Hinton on behalf of Ms. Richards. Thank you. All right. We're here today for a detention hearing to determine whether Ms. Richards will continue to be held without bail during the pretrial period. I've read a lot of stuff. I've reviewed the defendant's motion to consider defendant's constitutional right to bail, the state's bench brief, defendant's motion to set conditions for release, the state's response, and I read your reply filed last evening, Ms. Lazaro. Thank you. I apologize for the... It's fine. Uh, this is a dynamic situation. I'd like to hear from the state first. Who's leading the presentation? I am, Your Honor. Ms. Cassell, how would you like to proceed? Your Honor, we have three witnesses that we would like to call. Okay. Uh, we are prepared to call them uh, now. Who's the first witness? Uh, the first witness is Detective O'Driscoll. Do we have an exclusionary rule issue? I'm not sure it applies today, but I thought I'd ask. Uh, I'm not sure it does either, given sort of the loose nature as far as the rules go on this hearing. I, given the nature of the proceedings, and I'm sure what's to come, uh, extensive testimony in this case and a number of different uh, issues, I would ask that it be imposed. Uh, I mean, 1101 C4 would say the rules of evidence do not apply today. That is correct. Exclusionary rules, a rule of evidence. Yes. Okay. It's a reasonable request, but it's denied. Thank you. Uh, is it Detective O'Driscoll? Yes. Okay. If you'd step in front of Brittany, we'll get you sworn in. <laughs> You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter before the court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, subject to the pains and penalties of perjury. Good morning, Detective Adrisco. Can you please introduce yourself to the court and explain your relation to this case? My name is Detective O'Driscoll. I've been with the Summit County Sheriff's Office for seven years. I'm assigned to the Investigations Division. I was assigned to be the lead, lead detective in this case in April of this year. This case is an active case and the investigation is ongoing. Detective, what was the Sheriff's Office first involvement in this case? On March 4th, 2022, at 322 hours, Summit County Dispatch received a 911 call regarding an unresponsive male in the Francis area. Have you listened to that 911 call? Yes. Who placed that call? The defendant, Corey Richens. In addition to saying <clears throat> that uh, someone was unresponsive, did Ms. Richens, the defendant, identify who was unresponsive and anything else about that person's condition? Yes, she stated that it was her husband, Eric Richens, that was unresponsive, that he was cold to the touch and not breathing. Did EMS and police respond to that address? Yes. Is that the family home? Yes. Was a portion of the police and EMS response captured on police body camera video? Yes, it was. Have you reviewed that video? Yes, I have. On that video, what time does EMS pronounce Eric Richens dead? 0358 hours on March 4th. What, if anything else, does EMS say about how long he had been dead? One of the EMS personnel made the comment that he had been dead a while. Did the state medical examiner's office conduct an autopsy of Mr. Richens? Yes, they did. Have you reviewed the medical examiner's autopsy report? Yes. And the toxicology report that's part of that? Yes. What did the medical examiner identify as the cause of death? Drug intoxication with the specific drug being fentanyl. I'm going to now ask you, detectives, some questions about someone with the initial CL. Do you know who I'm talking about when I say CL? Yes, I do. Who is CL 
in relation to the defendant? CL is an associate of the defendant. Uh, she cleaned houses for the defendant's business as well as her personal home at times. Does CL have a criminal drug history? Yes. Is she under supervision in a different county, a county other than Summit County? Yes, she is. And is that in relation to certain drug charges? Yes. Does the program, does the court program in which she's in monitor treatment and testing, et cetera? Yes. Do you know how CL is performing in that program? Based on my interactions with CL, she is progressing through the stages of that program um, and that her personal outlook on her recovery is optimistic. Have you interviewed CL in connection with this case? Yes. Approximately how much time have you spent interviewing her? Over the course of multiple interviews, several hours each, I would say upwards of 10 hours. Was CL in uh, custody when you interviewed her? Yes, she was. Was that interview captured on video and audio recording? Yes. What, if any, promises did you make regarding C or to CL regarding her cooperation with being interviewed? CL was not made any specific promises, but at the outset of our interviews, we explained to her that her cooperation in our investigation would result in us working with the prosecutors that were responsible for the charges she was facing. Did you express to CL the seriousness of this case as well as the charges she was facing? Yes, we expressed to her the, the seriousness of the charges and the, the possible results of those charges. As well, we impressed upon her the importance or the value of her testimony in this case as, as it related to the charges that she was facing and that her testimony or any information that she may have was more important to us. Did you stress to CL that the information um, you were asking her about needed to be credible and verifiable? Yes, we, we told her at the beginning of our interview that any information that she may have we would need to corroborate in order for it to be of value to us. Did CL cooperate with being interviewed? Yes, she did. Did CL know Eric Richens? Yes, CL told us that during the time that she spent cleaning the Richens home, she got to know Eric, that she felt that he was a really good person, she liked him, and she was very saddened to hear that he had passed away. Did there come a time when investigators executed a search warrant on CL's home? Yes. In executing that warrant, did you make any observations consistent with CL's testimony that she felt bad about Eric Richens' death? Yes. Inside the home, we identified a bedroom that belonged to CL. In the bedroom, there was a mirror above a desk. Uh, on the mirror were taped or affixed several inspirational quotes uh, that seemed to relate to her recovery and her drug court program. Amongst all those uh, inspirational quotes was a newspaper clipping of Eric Richen's obituary. Did you get the impression that part of the reason CL cooperated is because she felt bad for Eric Richens? Yes, in fact, she said so many times in our interviews. Detective, I want to turn now to what, if anything, CL told you about the defendant requesting uh, that CL purchase fentanyl for the defendant. What did CL tell you? In our interviews, CL told us that in early 2022, the defendant reached out to her either by phone call or text message requesting that she procure fentanyl for what the defendant reported was a investor who had a back injury. And upon the defendant asking CL to get fentanyl, what did CL do? CL told us that she reached out to an acquaintance of hers, acquaintance one, and requested that she 
introduce her to somebody that could sell her fentanyl? Did acquaintance one introduce CL to someone that could sell CL fentanyl? Yes, CL said that acquaintance one provided her with a phone number of another acquaintance, acquaintance two, who was someone that she knew could sell CL fentanyl. And did CL say that she ultimately contacted acquaintance two? Yes, she did. What, if anything, did CL say about purchasing fentanyl from acquaintance two? CL told us that she contacted acquaintance two after receiving his phone number and asked to arrange to meet to purchase some fentanyl from him. She stated that sometime in February, she believed uh, she met up with acquaintance two at a Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased from him 15 to 30 round green blue pills, which she understood to be fentanyl. Using phone records through the course of your interview with CL, were you ultimately able to narrow down on what that date was in February that CL purchased fentanyl from acquaintance two at the Maverick and Draper? Yes, based on uh, forensic evidence, we were able to determine that that date was February 11th, 2022. What, if anything, did CL say about what she did with the fentanyl pills that she purchased from acquaintance two? CL told us that after purchasing the pills from acquaintance two, she returned home to her house in Heber. She said that either later that night or the next day, the defendant met her in the driveway of that home and did a hand-to-hand -hand exchange of pills for cash. I'm going to turn now, detective, to some questions um, regarding witnesses who corroborate CL's testimony, OK? OK. You mentioned acquaintance number one. Have investigators interviewed acquaintance one? Yes. Have you reviewed body camera audio and video of that interview? Yes. Does acquaintance one corroborate CL's testimony? Yes. She stated that CL contacted her in early 2022 and asked for someone that could sell her fentanyl. In the body cam, she also retrieves her cell phone and shows investigators the messages that corroborated that. And what kind of messages were they? They were messages between uh, acquaintance one and CL on Facebook Messenger app. And have you reviewed those messages? Yes. Is the first of those messages dated February 6, 2022 at 1.37 p.m.? Yes. Does it read, text me, I've got a question, won't do it on this? Yes. And that's CL <coughs> writing acquaintance one asking acquaintance one to text CL because she didn't want to write over Facebook Messenger? Correct. Did acquaintance one say whether or not she ever, in response, uh, contacted CL? Yes. She said that she then either texted or called her sub subsequent to her request. You testified that acquaintance two sold fentanyl pills to CL at the Maverick and Draper. Have investigators interviewed acquaintance two? Yes. Have you reviewed body camera audio and video of that interview? Yes, I have. Is acquaintance two able to co corroborate CL's testimony? Yes, acquaintance two was able to recall that he sold fentanyl pills to a friend of acquaintance one's in early 2022 at a Maverick gas station in Draper. I'm going to turn now, detective, to some forensic data questions um, and whether forensic data corroborates CL's narrative, OK? OK. Um, have you reviewed carrier records of the defendant's phone? Yes. And I want to just clarify one thing. I'm talking right now about carrier records, different than cell data records. Um, we'll have an expert 
testify about cell data records in a moment. I'm just going to ask you about the carrier records, okay? Okay. Um, what, if anything, do the carrier records for the defendant's phone, um, or what, if anything, in the carrier records for defendant's phone corroborate CL's testimony? The, the cell records from the defendant's phone show several phone calls back and forth between her and CL in early 2022. Do they show any text messages back and forth between the defendant and CL? Yes, several. Have you reviewed those text messages? We were only able to see the timestamps and who the sender and receiver was. We we're not able to see the content of those messages because they appear to be deleted from both the defendant's phone and CL's phone. Have you reviewed the call history and carrier records of CL's phone? Yes. Does CL's carrier records and call history corroborate CL's testimony? Yes. Is there a particular um, set of calls on February 11th, 2022, between 5.19 p.m. and 6.52 p.m. in CL's phone history? Yes. Question CL um, regarding those calls. Yes. She said those calls were to acquaintance two and that they were to arrange the specific date and time to pick up fentanyl in Draper. Turning now from CL's purchasing fentanyl for the defendant to the defendant's purported timeline on the night of Eric Richen's death, okay? Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier that police interactions with the defendant were captured on video. Have you reviewed that video? Yes, I have. Did the defendant provide police with a written statement in the early morning of March 4th, 2022? Yes, she did. Have you reviewed that statement? Yes. What on the early morning of Eric Richen's death did the defendant report had happened that evening? She stated that the last time that she saw Eric alive was between 9.30 and 9.45 p.m. She stated that before going to bed, they had had a drink together to celebrate uh, closing on a house for her business. She said that they got in bed between 9.30 and 9.45, and that shortly after getting into bed, one of the children had a nightmare, and that the defendant got out of bed and went to be with that child in their bedroom and slept in that bedroom until 3 a.m. or around 3 a.m. when she woke. She stated she returned to her own bedroom, got into bed, and felt that Eric was cold to the touch. She stated that she turned the light on, saw that he wasn't breathing, and that he didn't look normal, and that she then called 911. Did the defendant say whether anyone else was in their home other than the defendant, her husband Eric Richens, and their three young children? No, she stated no one else was in the home. Turning now to the defendant's statements regarding whether she performed CPR on her husband, okay? Okay. Um, did, the, did the defendant tell investigators when they arrived at her home shortly after she called 911 whether or not she performed CPR on Eric Richens? Yes, she reported that she did. I'm going to refer to someone now as defendant's best friend. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yes. What, if anything, did the defendant tell her best friend regarding whether she performed CPR on Eric Richens? Investigators found text messages between the defendant and her best friend that uh, was her explanation to her friend that she conducted CPR on Eric prior to EMS arrival. And do those text messages read, I pumped so damn hard, so hard, screaming at him to come back to life? Yes.
you testified earlier, Detective, that EMS responded. Have you interviewed the uh, first EMS responder? Yes, I have. What observations did that EMS responder make? They told me that when they arrived, they began CPR compressions on Eric, and that upon beginning those compressions, Eric began to foam at the mouth. He stated that that observation indicated that CPR was not likely conducted before he arrived. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you look into whether Eric Richens used illicit drugs? Yes. What did you determine? Based on the interviews that we conducted with those who knew Eric well, um, all stated that he did not use illicit drugs other than consuming THC gummies on occasion. Those that you spoke to include Eric's two best friends that he's known since high school? Yes, both made the same statement, that they never knew Eric to use any illicit substances other than the THC gummies. When I reference a hunting guide in Mexico by the initials um, TR, do you know who I'm referring to? Yes. Did you speak to this hunting guide? Uh, other Summit County detectives did, yes. And what did this hunting guide, if anything, say about Eric Richens using illicit drugs while hunting in Mexico? The guide told detectives that several of their clients, when they come to Mexico, will seek out someone that can put them in contact with illicit substances while they are down there for their hunt. He stated that Eric Richens was not one of these, that Eric was solely focused on the hunt. Has the defendant made any statements regarding whether her husband, Eric Richens, used illicit drugs other than THC? Yes, in several statements made by the defendant throughout the investigation, there have been at least 10 times that she has said that Eric does not use illicit substances and did not use illicit substances. And just to be clear, other than THC? Other than the THC gummies, correct. On the night uh, Eric Richens died, did investigators search the Richens' home? Yes. Did they find any illicit drugs? No. Did they find any paraphernalia or packaging or other evidence of illicit drugs? No. Did they find fentanyl anywhere in the home? Only that which was in Eric's body. I'm going to now shift, uh, Detective, from the night of Eric's death to a second drug buy initiated before his death and concluded after his death, okay? Okay. What, if anything, did CL tell you about the defendant approaching CL a second time for fentanyl? CL told us that approximately a week after delivering fentanyl, the defendant reached out to her again by text or, or call and said that she wanted some more fentanyl that was stronger than the previous batch. And in, in response, what, if anything, did CL do? CL told us that she again reached out to acquaintance one um, because she had lost the phone number for acquaintance two and again requested from acquaintance one that she provide her with the phone number for acquaintance two. She also made other statements in Facebook messages uh, regarding that request. In your interview, or detective's interview rather, with acquaintance one, did she corroborate that indeed CL reached back out to her asking for acquaintance two's phone number? Yes, in the same Facebook messenger, it, it showed the two different contacts on the two different dates. And does the second Facebook message, um, was it dated February 25th, 2022 at 9.40 p.m.? Yes. And does it read, I need those again, but more, and I don't got a ride, 
I lost your friend's number? Correct. Did CL and acquaintance one both say that acquaintance one provided CL's, CL with acquaintance, acquaintance two's phone number again? Yes. What then, if anything, did CL do with acquaintance two's phone number the second time? CL told us that she again contacted acquaintance two and arranged again to meet up at the same Maverick gas station in Draper to purchase again 15 to 30, this time blue round pills that she understood to be fentanyl. Between, uh, on the way to the Draper and Maverick, the second time, when she purchased 15, I'm sorry, did you say 15 to 30? What, yes, 15 to 30 pills. Which she believed to be fentanyl. Did she make any stops along the way? Yes, CL told us that the second time that she procured fentanyl for the defendant, she did not have a vehicle to drive on that date. She said that she reached out to a friend, acquaintance three, and asked that he give her a ride to go purchase fentanyl. She said that he did pick her up, that they traveled from Heber City to the defendant's home in Francis, where, according to CL, the defendant had told her there was a check waiting under the mat at the defendant's home. She said that she checked under the mat and didn't find a check, and so she knocked on the defendant's door, and the defendant came to the door and wrote her a check from her business, from the defendant's business, for $1,300 for the purchase of the fentanyl. CL told us that afterwards they drove to the America First Credit Union in Heber City where, the, where CL banks and cashed the check and deposited $300 of it into her account at America First Credit Union. She said that after stopping at the bank and getting the cash, they then drove to the Maverick gas station in Draper and purchased the pills from acquaintance too. Did investigators execute a warrant at the America First Credit Union um, in Heber? Yes, and that warrant returned a copy of the check written from the defendant's business account in the name of CL and a receipt that shows that it was cashed and that $300 were deposited into CL's account. And then CL ultimately being driven by acquaintance three in, sorry, went to the Maverick in Draper and purchased fentanyl a second time from acquaintance two. Correct. What, if anything, does acquaintance two say that corroborates CL's testimony? Acquaintance two in his interview stated that he remembered selling fentanyl to a friend of acquaintance ones on two separate occasions at the same Maverick gas station in Draper. He also said that he remembered the second time that he sold her the pills that CL was with another person who matched the age and gender of acquaintance three. Have you interviewed acquaintance three? Yes. What, if anything, does acquaintance three say to corroborate CL's testimony? Acquaintance three corroborated all the same details that CL told us about that day, and in fact, showed us text messages on his phone that also corroborated that story. Detective, I'm gonna ask you now some questions about what are commonly known as bug out bags, okay? Okay. Um, did investigators execute several search warrants on the defendant's home or the family home? Yes. Um, did those warrants identify what are commonly known as bug out bags? Yes. There were several uh, duffel bags stored in the garage along with uh, backpack sized day packs and each was identical and labeled for a different member of the Richens family. Um, those backpacks were seized subject to a warrant and were inventoried and photographed. Inside the bags, uh, detectives located several items that would be useful in a 
emergency situation. Um, but the most interesting were tr uh, documents needed for travel for each member of the family. Uh, each bag contained a photocopy of a state-issued ID in the children's case, along with uh, passports for Eric and the defendant, as well as global entry travel cards for both Eric and the defendant. Did those bags also contain clothing, toiletries, that kind of thing? Yes. Do detectives know when those bags were packed? No. And there was a bag for Eric as well, is that right? Correct. I have no further questions for you. Ms. Lazar on mine. Thank you. Oh, it's all dress call, right? Correct. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to follow a little bit the, the same timeline just so or we kind of keep things uh, together. Uh, you said you reviewed the body cam uh, that was provided on the night uh, that Eric passed away, correct? Correct. Okay. And that um, Corey made a statement that night to police, a written statement. Correct. Okay. And she told them that she had made a drink, correct? Correct. Okay, so they were aware of that. Um, was there anything in that body cam or investigation uh, that talks about them looking for a glass that a drink had been made in? No. Okay. Um, but you said that they searched for illicit drugs, correct? I don't know if they searched for illicit drugs, but they searched the home. So they searched the home that night, knowing that he had a drink right before he went to bed, uh, and made no note that they had recovered glasses, looked for glasses, anything along those lines, correct? Not to my understanding. Okay. Um, you also testified that when you interviewed CL, she was working uh, on both a personal and I'm going to say professional capacity for Corey, correct? Correct. And she was cleaning houses um, that she was both cleaning Corey's personal home and then she would clean homes uh, that were uh, investment properties, correct? CL told us that she cleaned both homes for Ms. Richens' business as well as at another time frame she cleaned their personal home. Okay. So not necessarily at the same time. But at the time, she was cleaning homes for the business, correct? Which time are you referring to? Uh, on or about uh, the time leading up to or during your investigation, end of the year, end of 2021, beginning of 2022. At, at that time, from my understanding, what CL told us, she was cleaning only investment properties belonging to the Richens Realty Company. And she was getting compensated for that, correct? Yes. Okay, and so the check that you issued the search warrant on for the bank, that was written from Corey's business account, correct? Correct. Okay, so it could very well be that Corey was paying her for cleaning houses, correct? I don't want to speculate, but... It could be. It's Despite possible. what CL said, correct? Okay. Um, you also testified that um, CL was progressing through her drug court program and, and you were optimistic about how she would do in it, correct? No, I testified that she was optimistic about her own I'm personal sorry recovery. Sorry, I state that. How long uh, were you investigating CL? When did you begin investigating CL? I don't know an exact date, but the beginning of 2023. Okay. And were you monitoring what she was doing at that time? Yes. Okay. 
um, because you knew she had a boyfriend or this guy in Vegas, some other details about her life, correct? Uh, set of investigating CL, no, we didn't know all those details. But over the course of your investigation, you learned them? Correct. Okay. Did you, you have CL's phone? Summit County Sheriff's Office evidence texts do. But you've reviewed it? Yes. Okay. And you testified about text messages between CL and the defendant uh, on or about this time period you're looking at in February, correct? Correct. Did you uh, review any other information prior to that time about contact that CL and the defendant had had? I'm unsure. Did you even but look? But it's possible that we looked into communications. In, in this investigation, initial stages, we looked into communications with everybody that the defendant had been communicating with. Okay. But you don't, you don't recall or you didn't look for a pattern of communication between CL and the defendant, is that correct? You were focused on February? I guess that depends on what, in what stages of the investigation you're talking about. I'm talking about any of them. Did you ever look and see if CL and the defendant texted each other about anything on a regular basis? Yes. Okay. And how far back did those go? I'm not sure on exact dates again, but into 2021. Okay. So for a period of time, because CL is working for the defendant, there's communication, correct? Correct. Okay. And nowhere in the communication between CL and defendant, text messages asking for drugs, correct? We didn't find any, but there were also time frames in the phones okay. when we looked at them. Now, I want to also talk about, you said you didn't make any promises. Uh, Correct. No specific promises. Okay. You did, however, tell her... Let me back up. When was the first inter interview you had with CL? I believe it was April 28th or 26th. Okay. I believe it was the 26th. Did you have any contact with her prior to that? No. Did anybody from law enforcement have contact with her prior to that? Not from our office. You don't know if anyone else talked to her? I don't. Okay. Now part of this uh, came out of a raid or, or something along the lines that was coordinated with at least ATF and some other agencies, correct? CL's home was subject to a search warrant based on information that we had gathered during our investigation into CL. Okay. And that search warrant would essentially contradict that she was doing well and what she was supposed to be doing in drug court, correct? She was buying drugs, wasn't she? We didn't know that. We knew that she was associating with people that we knew had active warrants for drug charges. Okay. And that would be a violation of drug court conditions, correct? From my understanding, yes, but I don't know the details of that. Okay. And as part of that search warrant, were uh, individuals arrested? CL was arrested, yes. There were other individuals who were arrested too, correct? I'm not recalling other individuals that were arrested on the date that this, the warrant was served. Okay. Were any drugs recovered at the home? Yes. Okay. And you also recovered a firearm uh, from CL's bedroom, correct? Correct. 
And that would be a violation of her drug court conditions, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, in this first interview in, in April, you begin the interview. by explaining to CL essentially how dire of a situation she's in, correct? I don't have the interview memorized, but I know we talked about that, yes. Okay, well you told her that she was on probation to drug court for four first degree felonies, correct? Correct. Okay, a violation of that is a potential prison sentence, correct? It would depend on the prosecutor, but that's potentially true. Okay, a first degree felony carries uh, a possible penalty of life in prison, correct? I don't know. I would have to reference the code. Okay. Um, so you also, so you told her she was facing problems with that, correct? That correct. this would be a violation. So she'd be on the hook for four first degree felonies. Potentially, yes. Okay. And you also told her that having the firearm um, could potentially be a new crime, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you also told her that the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, was essentially on board with screening uh, drug distribution charges, correct? I'm happy to play it if you don't remember. I don't remember specifically. Okay. Do you remember talking to her about potential federal charges? Yes. So she was aware that not only was she facing multiple first degree felony prison sentences, she was also potentially facing federal charges, correct? Correct. Okay. And during that initial interview, she tells you uh, that she didn't buy fentanyl, correct? I don't know if she made that specific statement, but she she talked about not knowing anything about fentanyl. Okay. And that interview lasted about an hour and 19 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, correct? Correct. Okay. And that interview ends well, with you telling her Sometimes you tell her to think through all of this and let you know if she wants to help. Yes, I gave her the opportunity to tell us up front whether she was willing to cooperate or if we should just not bother interviewing her anymore. Okay. But this is after you essentially tell her that she has the potential of doing considerable amount of state and federal prison time, potentially. Yes. This is a common tactic in law enforcement to be able to leverage charges for information. Okay. In fact, you did in this case leverage charges for information because you told her that you didn't care about first degree felonies or federal charges. What you cared about was information about I told her that I was interested in the information that she may know about this case. Okay. And, but you told her also that Eric died of a fentanyl overdose, correct? Correct. And you told her that you thought that Corey gave him the drugs, correct? I did not specifically say that. You alluded to the fact that you needed information about Corey getting fentanyl because that's how Eric died, correct? I don't know if I made that specific. The information that we tried to convey to CL was that we wanted to know the information that she may have regarding Eric's death. Okay. And you didn't care about any additional charges. All you cared about was that information, correct? As I said previously, we expressed to her that the information that she may have was more valuable to us than seeking charges against her. Okay. All right. 
and then you interview her two more times. Is that right? No, there were, I believe, three more after our first one. Okay. Were all of those audio and video recorded? Yes. Okay. And those were turned over to uh, the state in this case, correct? The state being the prosecutor's office? Now, forgive me, because with all these interviews, I'm not sure which one comes from which. Uh, You, in subsequent interviews, tell CL that she needs to give good enough details that will ensure that Corey gets convicted of murder, correct? I don't know if I made that specific statement, but I did express to her that the information that she gave us needed to be specific enough that we could corroborate it and that it could be presented to a courtroom. Okay. And that she was, quote, screwed at this point years if there's not cooperation, correct? No, I never made such statement. Okay. Did you ever tell her this was her get-out-of-jail-free card? No, I did not. Are you sure about that? Yes. Okay. Now, at some point, CL tells you that, in one of the interviews, that Corey contacted her between December and February to obtain prescription pills for an investor, correct? Correct. Okay. And she doesn't specifically state fentanyl at that point, correct? Are you referring to CL? I'm referring to CL. I don't remember, but I don't believe so. Okay. And in fact, in guessing it's something where around the second or third interview, um, CL says that those first pills, well, never says those first pills are fentanyl, correct? It never says that Corey asked for fentanyl, correct? I'm sorry, could you rephrase the question? Sorry. In, in, in those first, in the, the first transaction, so... Initially, CL tells you that there were three transactions prior to Eric's death, correct? Yes, and what I have to say here is that... Well, I'm just, of, that was a yes or no question. But none of the information that we got from CL was perfectly chronological. We had to piece it together over multiple interviews to come to the conclusion that we came to. Because you told her you needed more, something more specific to ensure that Corey gets convicted, right? No, we told her that we needed more details on what she was talking about and specific dates and times. Okay. But in the first one, she says there's three transactions prior to Eric's death, correct? At, at some point in our interviews, she told us that there were transactions. Okay. And she says that Corey was only looking for prescription pills or hydrocodone pills, to be specific, correct? CL referred to them as Roxy's. Okay. What do you know Roxy's to be? They can be different things in the drug world. They can either be counterfeit pills that are meant to look like a prescription pill, or they can be actual prescription pills, but generally they're known to be opiate-based drugs, whether illicit or pharmaceutical. Okay. So something along the lines of hydrocodone or oxycotton or something along those lines, correct? It could be, yes. And she specifically says that she was looking for $900 worth of fentanyl pills, correct? I don't know if initially, but she did make the statement of $900 at at one point in one of our interviews. Okay. And she says that Corey told her to leave the pills at an outdoor fire pit at the Midway House where there was cash, correct? 
I don't know if she made the, that exact statement, but yes, she told us that at some point in part of the exchange that she was instructed to leave pills in an outdoor fire pit in a house in Midway. Okay. And in fact, you sat there with her in this interview and did house searches, correct? Trying to figure out which house this was. Yes. Okay. Because um, she couldn't really tell you which house it was, correct? She couldn't give us an address, but she was confident that she could find it if she could drive there. Okay. And did you take her to, for a drive there? Yes. Okay. Did you ever do any follow-up investigation on uh, whether or not that house uh, ever sold? Yes. Okay. And you know that that house sold sometime in January of 2022, correct? What I understand, yes. Okay. So Ms. Richens no longer owned that home or <coughs> occupied that home or had access to that home in February, correct? I don't know. Well, the house was owned by somebody else, right? Again, I don't know. Well, you said it closed in January of 2022. From the information that I was told from other people, other investigators that had looked into that, I was told that Ms. Richens owned the house at some point and that it sold at some point. I don't know dates exactly. It would be important if uh, CL's telling you that she had access to the home and was there in February? Possibly. That might be a good fact to know. Okay. CL then does subsequent interviews, correct? Yes, we had multiple interviews with her. Okay. Um, and after being told that Vic, as your words are, correct? She now says that uh, it was specifically fentanyl that Corey asked for, correct? Correct. Okay. And that she didn't actually take the pills to that house in Midway. It was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction, correct? Like I said, she went back and forth on her memory on which instances referred to which transactions. And... Ultimately, she told us that she was sure that the first, the first transaction of fentanyl was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction in her driveway. Okay. And was what's been referred to as acquaintance three, was that in regard to that transaction? No. Okay. Was the second transaction. Were you ever to corroborate, was anyone with her that could corroborate that she saw... CL hand Corey drugs? Not that I know of. And then she states that now there was a third transaction that occurred after Eric's death, correct? She didn't make the statement that it was after Eric's death, but she told us there were three total transactions. Okay. So the information contained in the state's amended information, you don't know where that came from? Which information are you referring to? That she purchased drugs after Eric's death. Yes, I do know where it came from. Okay. Um, and you're saying CL did not sell drugs to Corey after Eric's death? CL could not remember specific dates and did not make mention that the transaction happened after Eric's death, but when presented with digital evidence from other witnesses, she confirmed that that was most likely correct. Okay. So she just agreed with your scenario of events, correct? No. In fact, several times during our interview, she told us that as we presented her more information, it helped her remember more. Okay. So as you're telling her to be more specific, you're providing her with information that you're gaining in the and she's saying, now I remember. Accurate? Yeah. yeah.
you also testified that you interviewed uh, two of Eric's best friends, right? Yes. Okay. And during one of those interviews, So I'm going to go back to, to CL for just a second. On this transaction that you allege that this check was used for, or the state alleges this check was used for, you testified that she picked up the check, there was a and cashed it, right? Correct. And drove to the Maverick and purchased fentanyl. She didn't drive, but she was Someone driving. drove her, yes. okay? And, and the person with her corroborates that. Correct. Uh, and that, that third witness never saw CL give those drugs to Corey, correct? Acquaintance three never saw that? Acquaintance three didn't tell us that he ever saw that, no. Okay. Um, in fact, there's no independent witness to corroborate that CL gave Ms. Corey those drugs, correct? No eyewitnesses that we have identified, but the investigation is ongoing. Okay. And CL is currently out of custody, right? Depends on your definition of custody, but she's not incarcerated, no. Not incarcerated, she's on, I think, ankle monitor and not to leave the county, right? Correct. But following your interviews with her, she was released from jail? Not immediately, no. She worked with the prosecutor in the other county where her drug court is and came to a resolution as to those charges against her. And part of that was being released on ankle monitor. Okay, so in exchange for the testimony, or in, not testimony, in exchange for the information that she provided to you, and a deal was worked out where she was placed, essentially released from jail on the order to show cause, correct? I don't know the specifics of what went on between the prosecutor and CL, okay. but subsequent to our interviews, we reached out to the prosecutor's office and let them know that she was being cooperative. After that, I was not involved in any decisions regarding her release. Okay, because that's up to the judge and whatnot. But, but you did communicate that to prosecutors? Yes. That she gave you the information you needed? That she was being cooperative with our investigation, yes. All right, I want to turn now to your interview, and, and I'm going to use initials. Are you okay with that? Um, you had an, an interview with um, one of Eric's friends. Uh, his initials are JS. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. That interview occurred about April 20th. Is that correct? That seems right. I don't know a specific date, but... Okay. And during that interview, he discussed or you discussed with him um, that he and another individual were essentially Eric's best friends, correct? Ms. Lozera, my apologies. Yes. April 20th of which year? Oh, 2023. Three. I apologize. Thank you. Um, at any point during that interview, did JS mention uh, that Eric had said that at any point during he and Corey's marriage, he was concerned that uh, Corey was attempting to poison him. I don't recall, but I don't think so. Okay. In fact, you present him essentially three scenarios of what could have happened to Eric, correct? That he essentially did it to himself, knowingly, that someone else did it to him, uh, or that it was accidental, right? Okay. And you specifically ask him if he thinks Corey would have done it, and he says, no, in my gut, I don't believe so, correct? I don't know if that was a direct quote, but yes, he said that he didn't believe that she would have done it. Okay. 
And he also states during that interview that at the time of his death, Eric and Corey's marriage was in a really good place. Yes. Correct? Now, he also details or, or talks about um, a falling out that he and Eric had had uh, over the course of their friendship, correct? Yes, that sounds familiar. And that Eric and his other friend uh, that he refers to in this interview actually had a falling out right before Eric passed away, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, also talk about... Uh, where he talks about um, the fact that of them at different times that had marital problems that they had helped each other through, correct? JS told told me that he and Eric and their other friend would confide in each other uh, about their marriages and uh, would share information. And that was, that was how he had the insight that he had into to Eric's life. Okay. He also talks about um, that Eric changed uh, or created these trust documents, correct? Correct. Okay. And his understanding, based on what he said that Eric told him, uh, was because <clears throat> Eric was pissed or upset um, about a relationship that Corey had had, correct? Or he thought he, she had. I don't remember the specifics of that that part of the interview, but I do remember that JS was aware that Eric had made the trust. Okay. And he doesn't specifically say anywhere in that interview that the trust was made because he was mad about this home equity loan, correct? JS expressed to us that he understood that the reason that Eric created the trust was to ensure his son's well-being if anything were to happen to him. Um, and he also expresses to you that uh, because you ask him why it wasn't changed back or be because the, the sister was made the trustee, correct? And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. The sister, so in the, sorry, that was a terrible question. In those trust documents, the sister was made the trustee, correct? From what I understand, yes. And you asked JS specifically or somewhere along the lines of, if they were doing so well, why would he have not changed that back? Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and he tells you uh, that it was his way of ensuring that even if they were doing well at the time, if there was a divorce, he would get the last word in it, right? I, I remember him using that phrase, getting the last word, yes. Now, you also testified today about this hunt that took place uh, down in Mexico, right? Correct. And this hunt was February of 2022, correct? I don't know specific dates, but I'm aware that Eric was on a hunt in Mexico shortly before his death. And JS tells you uh, that he was really upset, uh, actually leading in the days right before he passed away about what had happened with this hunt, right? Yes. And uh, he was upset that they had paid an outfitter 
uh, for a number of permits uh, that they believe the outfitter had procured, correct? correct? Yes, from what, I'm, from what I'm recalling, he was upset about the outfitter or the guide had not gotten enough permits for the amount of animals that they ended up taking, and it caused some concerns over uh, legal requirements of tagging animals. Okay. And getting the cape or anything else, correct? Correct. And this is the same, uh, is this outfitter the person that you investigated or that you interviewed? Someone associated with that hunt and that outfit, yes. I'm not sure the exact association, but a contact for that outfitter. Okay. So that outfitter was aware that they had made some serious problems uh, for Eric with regard to how many animals they took in Mexico, correct? According to JS, yes. Okay. And in your subsequent investigation, um, Eric had had um, some heated conversations actually the night uh, before he passed or the night that he passed away with that outfitter, correct? We received information about that, yeah. Okay. In fact, he was searching how far it was to drive from Scottsdale down there, correct? Correct. Well, his phone showed that search. Okay. And JS also told you that he had information or believed that this outfitter was somehow connected to the cartel, correct? I don't recall. That, that sounds familiar, but I don't recall if those were the words that he used. But essentially, he made, he made a, he, JS made a statement about the cartel when he was talking about Eric and that hunt, yes. Okay. Council, would you approach for a minute? Yes. Will you, uh, no. Will you turn the white noise on? My apologies. One second. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I need to handle an issue uh, with some members of the media that are live streaming without permission to do so. This is a good opportunity to take a restroom break. We're going to reverse the process we used on the way in. Uh, if the gallery would please follow the deputy's instructions, proceed orderly on the way out. I uh, will let you stretch your legs. We'll come back in in about 20 minutes. Thank you. Now.
Folks in the jury box can sit down if you'd like. You're okay. Counsel, you're okay to have a seat if you'd like. Thank you. Uh, if Ms. Richards would like to use the restroom, that's fine. All right, thanks. Folks, if you want to take a moment and use the restroom, Ms. Richens, if you'd like to use the restroom, stretch your legs, this is an opportune time. Thank you. I'm going to try and figure this out. Thank you. Taking a break to church, just yeah, that's fine. Okay, I uh, okay, I'm a representative for a TV present as well. Anyone, what's your name? Adrian, are you able to confirm whether or not you're just allocating the ABC for news stream or live streaming audio through WebEx? Oh, no, we're not on the WebEx, we are plugged into the media room with everyone else. Okay. That's fine. Oh, okay. Thank you for confirming. Sure thing. Okay. Chris, can you reach out to somebody from KUTV and confirm whether or not they're doing the same? Yeah, I will. Okay. Stay back. I'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. You should take a break while you can. Yeah. I gotta say this new WebEx update. It's a little Right. Remind me to unmute it when it's on Okay, very good.
in that corner. Yes, what form are we talking about? Um, you can fill it out, it's online. It's online? Okay. Yes, it's online. And it's got to go to the judge sign it. I track it in. If you get it approved, they'll give you the signal and send the box. Um, do you want to reposition your camera? I have some. The judge said you can film him. I can film the judge? Yes. Would it make it easier for your work? <laughs> um, well, yeah, possibly, yeah. Just slide over a little bit. What are you guys going to work with? Work with? Uh, yes, under, understood. The judge uh, does allow me to be reported. Excellent. Um, just uh, the bailiffs. And bailiffs are fine. Bailiffs are fine as well. Bailiffs are fine. The only person you can't report is. Hi. Hi. I'll do my best. I'll go under his. Perfect. Just, you got it. That being said, okay. You're okay.
Have a seat, please. All right, Detective. Here's Ms. Lazaro, I apologize for that interruption. Please proceed. No problem. I am sure everyone appreciates it. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, Detective, just a couple more points I want to ask some questions on. Um, there was some discussion during your uh, testimony elicited by the state about um, CPR given uh, when the night that Eric passed away, correct? Correct. All right. Um, and you've reviewed the case file. Uh, Eric a sheet on the floor at the foot of the bed, correct? Correct. And that was because when Corey was on the phone with the 911 dispatcher, she was directed to remove him from the bed to the floor, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the um, 911 dispatcher told her to uh, attempt to conduct CPR, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, do you know if Corey's certified in CPR? I do not. Okay. And for someone in your training experience, if someone doesn't know how to do CPR, uh, it's entirely try, it may not be effective. Sure. Um, you also talked about what you refer to as bug out bags, correct? Correct. Um, I'm not um, from Utah, but given the amount of time I've been, um, it's somewhat customary for people to prepare for things here, correct? From my experience, yes. Um, so that would include like food storage, perhaps packing a bag, correct? Yes. Okay. And one of those bags was Eric's, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, do you recall um, a label with a date on that bag? I don't recall a date, but I do recall from photographs seeing it labeled as Eric's, yes. Okay. Um, and did you, you said that there was a uh, Identification documents in there, correct? Correct. Are you aware that those are now expired? No. Okay. Uh, you came onto this case in, or when did you come onto this case? In April of this year. Okay. You took over as lead detective? Yes. And uh, you at some point after that, went to Corey's home, correct? Correct. Okay. And introduced yourself and asked her, um, do you remember me? You coached my son, correct? Correct. Okay. And who was the other detective with you? Sergeant Hoffmeyer. Okay. And Sergeant Hoffmeyer said, hey, I know your best friend. She coached my son, correct? Uh, and presumably, because you are the lead detective, you knew she was represented at that time, correct? I was not aware of that. Okay, so you had reviewed the entire case file and did not know she had. I had not in re reviewed the entire case file at the time that I approached Ms. Richens. Okay. I went to the house to introduce myself as the new detective so that she would know that what was going on with the case. Um, do you have any? with the district attorney's office prior to you talking to her? I do not think so. Okay. Um, were you aware of a letter in the file that I had sent to and specifically um, your office um, addressed um, the Summit County Sheriff, Mr. Martinez, that I was counsel in the case? I was not aware of that letter at the time. Okay. Uh, and you discussed uh, with the case, correct? After she yes. Okay. Did you uh, ever ask her if she'd like a lawyer present? Yes. At one point, her mother came to the house and made a point of should she be talking to us. And I said, if you would like to have your attorney here, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, but this was after you'd been talking to her, right? Mm -hmm. Are you 
but remind me of the other detective's name again. I apologize. Sergeant Hoffmeyer. Hoffmeyer. Are you aware of a conversation uh, between uh, Sergeant Hoffmeyer and Corey where she asks why Detective Woody was removed from the case and he tells her before mishandling Did he ever make mention of that? On that date at that time, I, no, I don't believe so. Okay. Was Detective Woody removed from the case? She wasn't removed from the case. She could no longer fulfill those duties. Okay, what is she doing now? She's in patrol. Traffic? No, patrol. Patrol, yes. as in like a responding to Responding to emergency calls, yeah. Okay. She's she also was... part of the canine unit. So she went from being the lead detective in a murder investigation, potentially, to patrol, correct? That happened in our office. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bloodworth, anything further? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Within the scope of Cross, please. Detective, on cross-examination, um, Ms. Lazaro asked you about um, Ms. Richens' narrative from that night that she gave her husband a drink. Do you recall that? Yes. And she asked you about whether or not the police recovered um, a glass, a cup, a mug, some kind of container for that drink that evening. Do you remember that? Yes. Were there any glasses or containers um, near the defendant that evening? On the evening of the death, is that what you're referring to? Correct. I guess it's the morning of the 4th when police arrived. Right. Um, I, I'm unsure without being there on scene. But from reviewing the body, Am I right that the only information that indeed Ms. Richens, Corey Richens, the defendant, gave her husband Eric Richens a drink was the defendant's own words, right? Yes. Ms. Lazaro had asked you about um, gaps in time frames in cell phones. Based on the carrier records, what have you been able to determine about gaps, particularly from early January until shortly after the defendants? We were able to determine from looking at the phone that it appeared that data from several different apps in the phone was missing in that time frame between January and just shortly after Eric Richards' death. Let me turn now back to CL. The very first time you met with CL, you testified that you kind of laid out kind of the predicament she was in facing serious charges but having potentially valuable information regarding a very serious death investigation, right? Correct. After that first meeting, how long until you began questioning her about the, the, the drug purchases? Four, four or five days. So you laid everything out for her on the first meeting and then gave her four or five days to consider whether she would operate and then interviewed her substantively? Correct. Let me talk about that interview. How long after Eric Richards' death are you now interviewing CL? Over a year. And a year and a couple months. In order to judge what, if anything, did you show her? We showed her uh, the contents of her phone that we seized from her home. Um, we showed her applications, Google Maps, Google Earth. We showed her other witnesses' uh, phones or screenshots of those phones. And the, the other witnesses' phones or screenshots of those you showed her screenshots of communications between her and that other witness? Correct. With the idea that those might jog her memory? Correct. Is that kind of 
iterative approach of showing a, um, an interviewee information, is that common when you're interviewing somebody a year after the event, which you're asking them to recall? Yes. As from my experience, people have a difficulty recalling information, especially specific dates from that long ago. Let me turn now to the April 13th, 2023 date when you introduced yourself to Miss Ms. Richens, the defendant. What's the first thing the defendant did when you introduced yourself? Oh. And about how long did she talk? Three hours. Did she give any... Very excited to talk to you and surprised you taking so long to come talk to her? Yeah, she made multiple statements that she was glad the investigators were there to talk to her because she felt that she hadn't been uh, in contact with the sheriff's office uh, very frequently before that day. And did there come one or even several times towards the end of the interview when you said your goodbyes, tried to leave, and she continued to talk? Yes. The interview after you and Sergeant Hoffmeyer left, did she email Sergeant Hoffmeyer with some follow-up? Yes, she sent an email with follow-up information. And Sergeant. I'm going to mark it agreeable as States Exhibit 1, a transcript of that April 13, 2020 interview. Ms. Lazaro, have you seen it? Show it to Ms. Lazaro first. Um, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, counsel has the audio of, of the interview. I might get the audio. Is that correct? I believe so. There's a lot there. I okay. Have, but we, All right. we can proceed for today's purposes. Um, Your Honor, for purposes of today's hearing, the state would like to move this new evidence as Exhibit 1. The state asked that the court file it private at this point. We weren't sure this was going to come up today. Um, we may need to redact some names from it before it goes public. Yeah, we're not going to put it in the docket at all, but it can be admitted for as State's 1 for the purposes of today's uh, uh, detention hearing. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Driscoll, um, you recall Ms. Lazaro asked you some questions about interviewing somebody with the initials J.S. And it's approximately April the 20th, 2023, right? Correct. And at that point, how long had you been active on the investigation? Less than two weeks. And you told, um, I think you testified, you told... J.S., something like you thought there were three alternatives. One was an accidental death, an accidental overdose, uh, suicide, or homicide. Is that right? Correct. At that point in your investigation, were you looking into and investigating all three of those alternatives? Yes. At that time, I had little information about the case other than the couple of interviews that I had conducted and I was trying to keep an open mind to all the possibilities. Thank you. No further questions. We're good, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Okay. Anything further, Ms. Lazar? <clears throat> no. That's fine. You can step down, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the state's... Chris Cotrodemus. Sir, if you'd step in front of Brittany, we'll get you sworn in. Please raise your hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter before the court to be the truth, the whole truth, to the pains and penalties of perjury? Sir, could you please? And spell your last name. Sure, it's Chris Kotrodemus. Last name is K-O-T-R-O-D-I-M-O-S. Thank you. 
Mr. Coacher Dimas, how are you employed at this point in time? Um, I own a private investigation firm. What's that called? M20 Solutions. How long have you been the owner of that firm? Uh, about seven months. <laughs> what did you do uh, prior to owning that business? I was a police officer for over 23 years. And where uh, did you work as a I was worked with uh, Carolina, uh, Utah, and uh, took a position with uh, Salt Lake City Police Department where I worked there. Um, in 2017, I took a position with the Salt Lake County District Attorney's Office on the homicide team there and um, until my retirement in December of 2022. Do you have any specialized uh um, training or experience with forensic digital evidence? I do, yes. Could you briefly explain what that is? Sure. Um, so I have, um, I've attended several formal courses, uh, one being a Cellbright Certified Operator uh, course, a Cellbright Certified Physical Analyzer course. I've also attended a 40-hour uh, uh, cell phone and mapping um, course through ZX. Um, after using those skills for several years, I also attended a ZX 40-hour subject matter expert course on the same subject, uh, cell phone, social media mapping, those types of things. Um, my experience related to my testimony and the worked either directly or indirectly on more than 200 homicides and major crimes inspected of phone and social media and phone downloads. Thank you. What is your role uh, in the case that brings you to court today? Uh, I was retained by the uh, Summit County Attorney's Office to evaluate uh, digital evidence in this case. And what evidence have you reviewed? Uh, I reviewed uh, several cell phone downloads or extractions. I've reviewed and analyzed cell records and um, records, things like that. The difference between carrier records and uh, call data records are? Yeah, so uh, a call data record or a, a cell download is it's called, is information that is downloaded from a phone onto some type of media, uh, external drive, things like that. And it does so into a read which you're able to uh, analyze the data that's contained within a device, a cell phone extraction or download. A carrier record or detail record is the regular record that you would have. It's the usage of the carrier. So it records the date and times of your calls, your text, your data usage um, for a given period of time. And it can include location information, such as like tower data. Discrepancies between um, carrier records and the data that's extracted from a device. Yes. What would cause that? Uh, usually, sometimes it's because it just wasn't captured in the in the phone download due to a, a software limitation. But typically, where we see it is through deletion of information on the that does not match the carrier records that we receive from the phone company. Uh, forensic extractions of an iPhone um, belonging to the defendant that was seized April 13th of 2022? I did. Does it contain uh, digital information pertaining to the night of March 3rd and into the morning of March 4th, 2022? It does. What does uh, show? Well, let me ask you this time that that phone is used on March 3rd of 2022. Activity reported on the defendant's phone is an activity device movement to 33 hours or 10.33 p.m. on March 3rd. When was the next time that that phone was used? The phone was inactive and then ultimately unlocked at 3.07 a.m. on March 4th, 2022. Was there anything that uh, happened between those two time frames? 
On that device? On no. that device. No. Does the extraction of that phone indicate it moved in that time frame? It does. And how are you able to tell that? Through the download. In this case, we use Cellbrite uh, for the download. Um, in the download, it gives uh, an activity, like a connected device activity movement. Usually that's an indicator of another connected device, such as a tablet or watch or something of that nature. Those two, yeah, I'm sorry, those, those, two, those two devices will communicate with each other and report potential movement of the phone through that application. Was there anything significant that occurred at 322 hours on March 4th? At 322, yes, a 911 call was made. Okay. So between uh, the time that the phone uh, is used at 307 that morning and 322, is there any activity that can be seen from the download? There is. What is that? Um, at 3.07, the device is unlocked. At 3.08 a.m., the device reports some type of movement. Either the device itself or a connected device is moving. Um, at 3.12, the phone was unlocked. At 3.16, the phone was unlocked again. At 3.19, the phone was unlocked again, potentially twice. There was movement again at 321, and then at 322, the 911. So roughly a time frame of 15 minutes between the first used and uh, the time that a 911 call is placed. Correct. Okay. Now, the attached device that's recording movement, um, could that be an Apple Watch? It could be. Do you have any way of uh, telling from the extraction you uh, you examined what that device was that was recording that movement? So far in the extraction, I have not been able to. I may at some point, but at this point, no. Okay. And as far as the movement, um, is this, what kind of movement is this? Is it significant? Uh, it is significant, I think, for, for it occurring in a home. Uh, and can you explain what that movement was? Correct. So at 3.08, there's movement on the phone, um, or on a device is, is, is connected to that phone is moving. And it's, um, it moves, I don't remember the exact amount of time, but I believe it's several feet. I do know that at um, some point, there was two movements right before the 911 call, and they're both significant. One was 200 and about 240 feet, it's like 74 meters and change. And the other one was um, about 130 feet. And this is all, this is right before the, the 911 call. Before, okay, thank you. As you were uh, analyzing the forensic data from that extraction, were you able to um, observe any noticeable uh, patterns of deletion from that phone? It appears that there is some deletion in that device. Okay. And can you describe what, what is being deleted in that phone? It looks like there's gaps in things like web history, web searches, um, particularly the call log. Um, when a person leaves a call or a text, those are recorded in the call log of the phone. And there are texts from, there's messaging that is included in the carrier report that I would expect to see also logged within the device that are not in the device. Okay, so you're seeing those in the carrier records but not on the device themselves. Multiple calls and texts to an individual. I would expect to also see the call log of the device itself. And in a lot of instances, particularly to the, uh, to the there's a lot of that is missing. And from the carrier records, are you able to tell who those calls were going to? Yes. Who was that? Uh, there were several people. Um, but in, as it relates to the case, one that stood out was just that has been mentioned as CL. In those uh, carrier records, were there uh, logs of calls made in January of 2022? I don't recall January. Okay. 
did you analyze uh, a forensic extraction of a second iPhone um, belonging to the defendant that was seized in May of 2023? Yes. When did uh, activity The activity on that phone started shortly after her original phone was seized in April of 2022. Were you able to observe uh, internet searches on that phone? Yes. And did you a PowerPoint of some of those searches? I did. Okay. And just for the court and uh, counsel's um, reference, this is uh, docket item 141. Were you able to tell when those searches were done? Yes. How did you do that? There is a date and time stamp of the history, the web history. So, for instance, if you visit a website and you click through it using your device, it will report what date and time that did that connected to that website. I see. On April 18th of 2022, um, internet site uh, of an article entitled "What Happens to Deleted Messages." On May 10th of 2022. Did that phone access a site for an article uh, entitled, How Do Police and Forensic Analysts Recover Deleted Data from Phones? Yes. Did that phone uh, ever, uh, was, or was a, a query placed in that phone Quote, can cops, period, uncover, deleted, period, messages, iPhone, close quote. Yes. Did that phone search, quote, how to, period, permanently delete information from an iPhone remotely, close quote? Yes. Did that phone search, quote, luxury for the rich in America? It did. Did that phone search, quote, if someone is poisoned, what does it go down on the death certificate as, close quote? Yes. Were you able to tell when those things were searched? The search themselves, there was no uh, date and time reported for the individual search. However, I found uh, corresponding websites to those searches that did have the date web history. And was there a certain time frame that these searches were made? There Can you describe what that was? Uh, it was typically between, well, shortly after her original phone was seized. So a, from April, middle of April of 2022 through, I want to, memory serves me right, about August of 2022 off and on. Thank you. Now you mentioned uh, your training with um, cell phone mapping using cell tower data. Yes. Uh, have you employed in your review of the evidence in this case? I have. Um, can you explain just briefly how uh, cell phone mapping is done using cell phone uh, sure. cell tower data? Sure. I'm sorry I look that way. I'm used to talking to a jury. <laughs> so, uh, so it's um, mapping is accomplished by taking call detail records that contain tower location in them and putting them into a piece of software that will visually show you a location on a map of which tower that that device was accessing when it made or received a call or a text. So it takes lines of data and creates a map out of it. Okay. And is that plotted on like a, a program like Google Earth? It is. Okay. Yeah. And are you able to tell reality from, from when a, a phone connects to a tower, is there any directionality to that approximately where that phone is, is transmitting from? Yes, yeah. Uh, it, so the cell phone, the, the companies report which tower the device is utilizing and which is an estimated range to that, which is a bit ambiguous. However, it will tell us at least what side of the tower that the device was located when it made or received the call. How many sectors are there on each cell tower? Three. And so if a, a phone is connecting to a tower through a certain sector, you can tell that it's someplace um, 
where that's for lack of a better word, broadcasting or collecting yeah. signals. Yeah, so we can, we, can, we can determine the orientation of the device to certain locations. I see. Yeah. Did you map data from uh, CL's phone extraction? I did. Were you able to track that phone's movements on February 11th? I do. Yes. At any time, was it at or near a Maverick gas station in Draper, Utah? It is. And uh, are you aware that that location in this investigation? I am. This is the location that CL had indicated to detectives that she bought drugs on behalf of the defendant. Do you recall approximately what time of day that was it was there? She shows up on that tower near that Maverick at about 6.49 p.m. and remains there until about 8 p.m. 2022. Does that phone make any calls or sales while at that location? It did. And to anyone notable to this investigation? Yes, two people. Who was that? Uh, one other acquaintance in which she had purchased the drugs from, and CL was also texting with the defendant. While well, she was at a gas station in Draper, Correct. On that day, did the phone go to a locate, uh, location in Heber City? It did. Was the mapping that you did uh, CL's phone consistent with that CL gave to law enforcement regarding that first drug purchase? Yes. <laughs> Be able to track CL's phone movements on March 9th of 2022. Yes. In Francis, Utah, on that day. It was. Was it ever at or near the same uh, Maverick in? Were there any communications from the phone at that time while it was at the Maverick? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, did it? belonging to a person relevant to this investigation. It did. Who was that? Uh, at the Maverick, it communicated with, I guess, corroborating witnesses to the drug purchase on the 9th. Um, when the device was utilizing it in Francis, it was about mid 9th, and uh, CL's phone was in communication with the defendant's phone. Utah. Correct. Did the phone go to a location in Midway, Utah, on or about that day? Yes. Are the movements that you did uh, for CL's cell phone on March 9th of 2022 consistent with uh, the information she gave to law enforcement in this investigation? Finally, I want to speak with you briefly about uh, Mr. Eric Richens' phone. Uh, did you analyze a forensic extraction? I did. When was the last use uh, recorded um, from Eric's phone? From memory, I believe it was p.m. on March 3rd, 2022. And are the times that are on the extract are populated uh, in the Celebrate download, are those what... Uh, time zone are those given in? Uh, typically the, the the extraction is provided zero. Oh. And so do you have to, so can you just briefly explain what UTC zero is? Right, so UTC zero is Greenwich Mean Time. It's an effort by utilize investigations to try and keep everybody on the same time zone. Um, Utah is in Utah is in minus seven daylight time and we are in minus six in daylight savings time so from in this case from November of 2022 to about March 13th I'm sorry November of 2021 March March 13th 2022 uh, in Utah with 
Okay. So if those times are given on that download as UTC minus five, that would be uh, each Correct. It would be two hours ahead of local. So to adjust for mountain standard time, you would have to go back two hours. You'd have to subtract two hours. Okay. Yes. And that's what gave you, um, can you, can you repeat that the last time that Eric's phone was used on, on March 3rd? I believe it was 9.58 p.m. on March 3rd. I just have one. Thank you, Mr. Coach Demas. At this time, thank you. testified there are uh, essentially two explanations for why things uh, might be missing. One in a download. One is that it's not captured in the In this case, all you can say definitively is that it's missing, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, with regard to, to movement, that could be any device that is attached to the phone through an app, correct? It could be, yes. Okay. And so um, you can't say, looking at what you analyzed, exactly what device that was, correct? So far, no. Okay. And you can't tell where that device was in terms of location, correct? Correct. Okay. So it's possible that that could have been a device from some other location, but the phone's recording it, correct? But it's possible if it's connected to an app. It depends. Okay. So it would be impossible outside a certain range. Okay. Um, and there's there's a number of different ways to, or yeah, I am not an expert in this, so <laughs> um, uh, there's programs or extractions that can be done on phones, correct? correct. Or different. Ways. Did you perform an independent extraction on this phone? I did not. Okay, or on any of the phones we you've talked about today? No. Did you analyze any data prior to January of 2022 on either CL's phone or either phone, or I guess the first phone belonging to Ms. Richens? I don't believe I did. Okay. Were you, at, uh, were you asked? Uh, not necessarily, no. Okay. Were you in range of interest? Okay. Um, and so you didn't cross-reference uh, any communication uh, or uh, communication between CL and Corey prior to January of 2022, correct? Correct. So it could be that they communicated all the time. You wouldn't have known. Yes. So this is just a question between the two. Um, were you made aware of when torrent was, or when the first phone was seized? Yes. Okay. Copy of the search. No. Okay. Um, were you made aware that torrent included evidence of homicide that they were looking at? No. Okay. Um, and in that first phone, prior to Eric passing away, did you, were you able to review any search of the web browser? Of uh, whose device? First device. Uh, of of Ms. Reed. Of Ms. Reed. yes, I, yes. Okay. And did you those related to fentanyl on that? Not that I found it. There were 
available to you. And <laughs> look at. <laughs> no, no searches related to prisons either. No, not in that time frame. Okay. No searches related to deleting messages. No. And so all the searches came from the second phone, correct? Uh, the web searches mentioned, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And phone that was seen issued for the first phone, correct? That was, yes. Because that's the phone so that she was, got as a replacement, right? Yes, okay. correct. Um, I just want to uh, return to um, this mapping, mapping uh, that you discussed. Um, Did you uh, look at uh, the mapping on the second phone of Miss Richens? I did not. Okay. So, to, to compare Miss Richens' phone to CL's location at any point, correct? They did. Okay. <laughs> yes. They but did. you couldn't do it, or no. didn't do it. The records, the the mapping location for those call detail records through Verizon are not no longer available. On the second phone on either phone. Okay, so you were able to get them off of CL's phone, but because of Verizon, you weren't able to get Ms. Richens' phone. Correct. Okay. And on that March 9th date, uh, you discussed her midday. Um, Maverick, uh, time, uh, was she at that Maverick? It was about or 3 p.m. After she, she was at, Francis. she was in Francis around midday. Okay. She was at the Maverick at about 2.33 p.m. Okay. Did she go back to Francis? She went to Heber. Okay. And she lives in Heber. I don't think I have any other questions. Thank you. Mr. Hill, anything further? No, thank you. So you can step down. Thank you. Ms. Cassell. Yes, yeah, Your Honor. Uh, State of Brooke Carrington. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter before the court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, pains and penalties of perjury? Morning. Morning. Could you spell your, I'm sorry, could you state your name and spell your last name, please? Brooke Carrington, K A R R I N G T O N. How are you? I am a principal managing partner at. Financial Forensics. Is this a company that you started? Yes, it is. And when did you do that? Um, officially in, I think, 2012, that business, but I did for about 35 years. What's the nature of your business? Um, I look at, most I get is forensic accounting, and this work is um, case Cases where there are allegations of fraud or missing or misappropriated funds, of bank transactions, and um, casework like that. And how long have you been doing that? 35 years next month. Do you have an undergraduate degree? I do. What is it in? And what about a <laughs> graduate degree? I have an MBA. Or, uh, I also am qualified in um, anti money laundering transactions, looking towards action in blockchain and cryptocurrency. So, this is probably uh, going to be a lot, but in your 35 years of forensic accountant counting, how many uh, cases have you worked on? A couple of years ago, I had to quantify that, and at that time, it was about 4,600. So. 
So probably more now. More now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, have you provided testimony in financial crimes cases? Yes, I have. How often? A handful of times per year, I would say. Okay. How did you first get um, involved in this case? I was originally contacted by the investigator for the estate of Eric Richens. And who's that? Todd Gabler. Okay. Why did he uh, contact you, or what, what, was, what was his reason for contacting you? Um, Mr. Gabler and I and colleagues for 30 years and he um, expressed to me that I have a skill set that he knows nothing about so okay and who hired you uh, the estate hired me initially okay and uh, at some point were you uh, retained by the summer yes when was that um, I believe it was um, May 31st of this year just a couple weeks ago okay um, so as part of your uh, being hired by the estate and, and being retained by the Summit County Attorney's Office, have you reviewed documents that are relevant in this case? Yes. What have you reviewed? I've reviewed bank account statements, tax return documents, real property records, specifically trust deeds and warranty deeds, uh, reconveyances. I've also reviewed insurance policies, tax information, Okay. Um, specifically with respect to um, any business, business that she owned? She owned several businesses, and the um, most, I believe, is K. Richens Realty. Okay. Um, what kind of business is that? It's in the business, in the, in the realty business, real estate business, and she flips homes, but she also acts as a realtor representing people who are purchasing. Okay. And uh, when did she start this business? It was registered in Utah in um, April of 2019. All right. Were you able to um, uh, find information regarding um, the defendant's selling of homes? Yes. And how did you find that information out? Those documents are typically recorded, and they are public documents, and they're typically at counties, um, recorder offices. There's also information along that line at the assessor offices, and each state has a little bit different process of doing them. Most of them do does, which is through the county recorder. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you, if I may approach, Your Honor. What's What's been marked as State's Exhibit Two? Do you recognize that? Yes. The schedule that I prepared. Um, I used the term "schedule" to talk about my work product um, and uh, the analysis and and how it's how I depict it. So this is um, a chronology of the real properties that I was able to identify attached to either Corey personal, Ms. Richens personally, or through her company. Okay. Um, does it show a, a timeline of acquisitions that she has made? Yes. And and I, I should underscore, this, this is a timeline of, that they were acquired. Okay. So just this is the front end of her ownership. Okay. And... Uh, in 2019, how much, and this is when her her business was was started. Is that correct? That's correct. How many homes uh, so far have you been able to tell whether or not the, or the have were 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 defendant? In 2019. Yes. In 2019, two properties listed. One of them is um, the home that they were living in, and that's when the uh, HELOC was taken out. And the other one is a different property. So I've listed. And you've listed um, a, an, an amount of, of uh, trust deeds for 2019. Is that right? That's correct. Can you explain what those are? Trust deeds are deeds that are recorded at the county recorder's office, are memorializing or um, documenting an obligation or an encumbrance on a, on a property. So this. 
certain amount, and that's expressed and documented in a trust deed. Okay. Uh, money, uh, I, I guess, what was the amount of the trust deeds in 2000? Those two trust deeds um, total $471,210.48. And you've done that for 2020 and 2021 as well, right? That's correct. And what was the amount in 2020 of trust deeds? 2020 was $2,069,280. On how much? Okay. And 2021, what, were, what was the uh, amount of trust deeds and, uh, the, the, the defendant acquired? Uh, the amount there is $6,260,458. On how many properties? On 13. Do you find this significant? Yes. On a positive note, it, it depicts that the business was growing and she was actively acquiring properties. I think it's noteworthy and it's an indication that things were growing quite significantly, and sometimes that is problematic. Now, why is, why is it problematic? Um, well, it's kind of a, ba a basic thing, like in business school, where growth is too strong, too um, is challenging for a business. Okay. Um, Were you able to determine at the end of 2021 um, how much the defendant was obligated uh, on those debts, those $6 million debts? And, and actually explain to me the difference. She, she, what, what does obligated on a debt mean? Ob that's, a, that's a very important question and a very, very important point to understand here. I don't have access point to the documents that tell me the terms of these loans. So I don't know what the interest rate is of these loans. I don't know the terms that she's agreed to for these loans. I don't know what payment is required on these loans. What I do know is these are what we colloquially call hard money lenders. And I do know on some of these what these lenders do require, and it's in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 percent. These are not conventional loans where there's a 30-year um, payment amortization. These are typically short-term loans and the flip, house flipping business, the fix and flip business, typically are turning those over a little so they don't need a 30-year loan. They need a shorter-term loan. Um, so I understand what I'm obligated on, but I do not know what the balance is at the end of a particular time period. I see. You need more to, uh, to, to make that determination, is that right? That's correct. And that would be the loan documents themselves, uh, the promissory notes, and the ledger from the lenders to show what payments were or were not made. And how the interest was related in other fees. Typically, these lenders have significant origination, loan origination fees. And if payments are late, then the um, interest rate is higher on the, the late payment, uh, perhaps default fees, things like that. OK. Um, so, so do you have a rough estimate on what, what she was obligated to? At the end of 2021? Yes. And what's that? At the end of 2021, it's a little over $4 million. Okay. And you don't know if that's what she, uh, what she, you don't know what she had paid back, but you know that that was what, at that point, she was obligated. On. That's the point she was obligated on that she still owned at that time. And this is, I, be, I, I believe I've done a pretty good job looking for property. Okay. that I don't know about. Okay. Um, two bank accounts that belonged to, uh, to the defendant? Yes. And um, what, is, what is servicing a debt? What does that mean? That would be a term that um, 
would explain that there is a debt outstanding and service would be the payments on that. If I have a credit card and I have a monthly payment or I have a balance due, my payment toward that credit card is called servicing my debt. Okay. And uh, were you able to determine which debt the defendant was servicing in December of 2021, for instance? Yes. Uh, how much was that? The, the debt payment. The debt payments were about 252000 in that month. To do. The debt payments that she made in 21, there were 94 payments, and those 94 payments totaled $252,000. Is there anything that you found uh, significant about those debt payments? Yes. What was, what was that? They were not to 94 individual entities. Some of them were weekly payments. For example, I know that she has an outstanding debt during that time uh, of $5,438 that was required to be paid weekly on a debt. Um, she has a $600 payment that is made daily for a period of time during December. and on most of those debts, the large majority of those debts are hers. Some of them are credit cards. And this was in a account you looked at. That's correct? just in one account, yes. And do you remember what account that was? Uh, that's the account 6577. Okay. Um, were you able uh, to determine? Um, Payments that were coming out of six five seven seven. I did. I did. I say that number correct? Yes. Yes, you did. Okay. Um, I know. I know of one um, one um, account that she has that had sued her, and they filed suit in New York in De um, December 9th of two thousand twenty one. Okay. But uh, and and uh, to ask you about that, I will ask you about that one in a minute. Okay. But were you able to? to look at her, to that, the bank account, and, and determine whether or not she was current on her payments or whether her payments were going through correctly? I, if she was current on her payments, um, I can say about those payments that several of them did not clear the bank. And during- Why was that? She was in the negative in that account from a good part of that month. She was, um, $22,000 in the hole okay. for, for a good part of that month. So so you, you noticed that at least in, in, for that account in that month that there are, that some of the payments to the hard money lenders were not going through? That's correct. Okay. Did you notice any like uh, charges for overdraft fees or anything like that? Yes. Okay. Well, what did you notice about that? They were $25 each and... Um, Sorry, I don't recall what the cumulative number is for that, but they, there were dozens. Okay. Now I want to ask you, so you said that there was a, a, a lawsuit that you were familiar with um, out of New York? Yes. Um, can you explain what, that, what you found out about that? So in that case, they did file the um, agreement. And so uh, from that, it's that Ms. Richens used receivables of $87,000 are her potential revenue. It's, it's performed or earned, and she's expecting to her company as revenues. So that's $87,000 that's stated in, in the case, uh, in the document that they filed with it. And that agreement also says that she's borrowing $60,000 against that $87,000 at 15%. So shows, um, spells out the terms of the she's to make weekly payments of $5,438 as paid. Do you know uh, what it was brought? Or what the, what the what the document 
complaint about why the lawsuit was brought? According to the complaint, which is the other side's version of what happened, that she made uh, payments of about $1,000, so that would be a little shy of four payments, and um, then after that she defaulted. Okay. And when was that lawsuit filed? December 9th, 2021. So we talked a little bit about the um, the, the bank account. Uh, uh, do you know where where uh, the K Richens Realty bank account? What the bank the bank is? Where they banked? Where they banked? Yes. That's what a, is that? America First Credit Union. Okay. Um, and were there other America First Credit Union accounts that you um, were able to look at? Yes. And uh, when were you able to look at that? Over this past year. Okay. Um, how many accounts did you get access to? Twelve. Okay. Were some significant? Yes. Were, were some not? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to ask you specifically about each of these in order. Not each of them, but a couple of them in order. Um, there's this, the 6577, is that right? That's correct. That was, and that was the K. Richens Realty, right? That, that is the account, and that's, as far as I can tell, that's primarily the transactions were housed. And you said primarily the lend, lending payments? Primarily there. Okay. Uh, and that one ended up in uh, negative 2200 22,000 22,000 that's I'm sorry you're right 22,000 did you look at uh, 2204 yes what is what primarily was that that's the joint account so we would call that a personal account it's a joint account it's held jointly between with Eric and Corey Richens anything account to you? Yes. What was that? Well, I, I, it's important to me to look at of, of the account leading up to a significant important to understand the nature of an account. And so 2020, long before the period that's relevant specifically in this case or that is people are concerned about to understand what the nature is, the, the character of that account, how is it used, and what's typical for a particular account holder. It may be different for every person and every... Um, I looked at this account, and typically it is an account that is used to pay credit cards and um, kids' expenses and family expenses. That. Okay. Uh, as, a, as you reviewed the account? Yes. As we get to the time period that's relevant here, which is like the months leading up to Eric's death, I would term that, and then what happened after. Um, there are there's between accounts and amongst accounts. Um, I can see, you know, Eric's payroll coming into that account. I can see there are some deposits from, or transfers, I guess should should say, from K. Richens Realty, um, payments going back to K. Richens Realty. Um, there's there's marked increase in the number of transfers that occur in the account and all of the, all of the Okay. So you actually around in that account, say, Late, late, late twenty. Is that is that why is that significant? Why do you find that significant? Well, you know, I'm looking for what's what's typical or what makes sense, and so I'm looking at you know what's happening in the business account and does that influence what happens in the personal account. Um, happening in the acquisition of properties and how how those move together and so there's this crescendo 
that happens in the like in the months leading up to Eric's death. There, there are indicators of an increase of chaos, loss of control, and larger amounts of money moving accounts. Positive way or a negative way? It feels hazard. There's not a pattern. There's not a practice that there had been a little bit earlier in in my review, and there are transactions that don't clear when there's you know money is moving around just to cover transactions. Okay. The, those transactions that don't clear in a minute, um, but I'm going to go to ask you. Four four. Are you familiar? Yes. What is that account? That is also a personal account. That was opened in 2013. And the the header on the bank statement has Corey's name, but the signature card and, and until I looked at the signature card, I thought that was just Corey's account, but the signature and Corey as a joint. And what is that uh what do you believe that's primarily focused when you review of that account? I thought that was a business account. Okay. Is that what you continue to think? I mean, it's, I guess you're It's technically a personal account. Okay. According to America First, that's a personal account, but it is used as a business account. And why do you say that? Because of the transactions that are contained within the account. What kind of transactions are they? There are some payments for, uh, for the loans on these there are um, expenses that would be typical of a business rather than um, personal. But there are there are some personal expenses there. I'm I'm not saying to be, to be prejudicial or, or negative or anything. It, it just um, are there uh, any credit card payments coming out of that account? Yes. What? what uh, how? How many credit? credit card payments coming out of that account? I, I didn't quantify that. Okay. So um, at the end of, tw did you review the uh, bank statement for that account the, for the end of 2021? Yes. Uh, what was the status of the, the account? That negative. Um, about in negative about 1100 1700 something like that was there a uh, line of credit yes there was how much was the line of credit 3200 and what was the status of the line of credit and that was ex that was tap um, exceeded okay. that was tapped out okay so you mentioned some um, I guess Transactions that did not clear. Is that is that how you put that? That I did. Yes. Okay. Um, and where did those? In what account uh, was, were there transactions that did not clear? Do you remember? I know the six five seven seven account, five two four four. The five two four four is the one we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. The two two. The personal account, the joint personal account. And that also had a lot of money moving and, and did have some transactions that did not clear. So I'm going to uh, direct your attention to a, 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 a uh, that occurred on October 13th of 2021. Do you remember? From a, from a October 23rd of 2021? 13th. October, th um, for, for what amount? For four thousand. Yes. Okay. Tell me, tell me, uh, and that was into um, that was into six five seven seven. Is that right? Is that if that's I believe right? so. Are we talking about twenty twenty one? Yes. Okay. And it was from Penn Fed. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Tell me. T can you tell me about that? Do you recall about that transaction? PenFed Credit Union is a credit union where Corey Richens has accounts and and that becomes a significant issue later. Um, but that that um, check was deposited into the account and then it didn't return unpaid. 
Uh, and do you uh, uh, recall if there were any transactions made out of that, out of the account between the time the check was deposited and, uh, and it came back unpaid? There were transactions, yes. Okay. And there was another uh, couple of checks were deposited um, in November that did not clear. Do you remember? Remember that there were checks, yes. Okay. Checks were deposited. Do you remember if there were any payments made out? Transferred mm. to or where they was, were transferred? I don't recall specifically, no. Okay. But there was money transferred out between the time the check was deposited that didn't clear and the time it Okay. And then in um, 12 or December 12 of 2021, any checks that were deposited, a check for $10,000 and a from the Navy Federal Credit Union. Yes. Um, and what happened to that check? That did not clear as well. Okay. And checks take a while not to clear, right? Is that it's credited to time in between the, the credit and the and the coming back not cleared? Is that right? Yes, that's but it, it depends on the relationships between those financial institutions. Sometimes they'll clear, sometimes they'll take a few days. Now, the, these uh, five days, is that, would that be That's right? correct. Okay. I, I remember that there were two that that did not clear, and they both came from um, Ms. Richens' uh, Navy Federal Credit Union account. So these were by the and uh, on the Navy Federal Credit Union account and deposited into her. That's correct. That didn't. Was there money time that the uh, check was deposited and the time it, it came as unpaid, were there any transactions out of the 6577 account? Yes, there were. And were they? I but there, but there, was a t there was a time when the money That's correct. Um, In, in 657, do you uh, recall, uh, I know you tested it was overdrawn at the end of the year. Do you recall if it was overdrawn prior, uh, again, prior to uh, uh, Eric's death? I do. I don't remember the amount, but it was overdrawn. Yes. Um, do you, uh, and again, I want to. To five two four four, yes, and I think, so I think we can move on. Okay. Um, let me ask you about the life insurance uh, policies. Are you familiar with uh, life insurance policies that yes. on Eric's life? Yes. Um, how many life insurance policies were there that on Eric's life at the time of his death? I believe there were six. Okay. And uh, seven. Who? I mean, what, what were they? Can you explain what the life insurance policies were? Yes. Uh, the first was uh, through Minnesota Life for $347,000, and that was um, what is typically called the mortgage, home mortgage policy, in which the, if the insured passes away, the, the home's paid off, and they write it at the amount of um, what what the loan balance was at the time the policy is taken out. And so whatever the loan is at the time of death, um, I believe that loan is like 72%. They'll pay 72% of the outstanding loan. And so that one was paid. Okay. And, and then there's, um, there's a life insurance policy that um, Eric and his business partner had on each other, basically, and that's uh, in coordination with a buy-sell agreement on their business. And so if one of them passes away, the other would be the beneficiary of that life insurance policy. There is, let me just ask you about the, instead of going through one at a time, um, how, besides the, the life insurance that uh, was on Eric's business, um, what was the amount of, uh, of money that um, Eric's life was insured for um, at the time of his death? About $1.2 million, aside from the business buy-sell policy. 
And are you familiar with any any uh, um, any attempt to change the beneficiary of the business policy? I'm aware that that is the report, yes. And what was the report? That on uh, New Year's Day of 2022, that in New York Life's um, online portal, someone had logged in and had changed the beneficiaries on that um, on that policy to provisions. Okay. And that was changed back, as far as you know, at the t uh, had been changed back at the time of Eric's death. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Um, You know how much money uh, the defendant got in insurance payouts? One point three million dollars, a little bit, a little bit more than that. One point three million in June of two thousand twenty-two. Okay. Can I just have a minute, Your Honor? Of course. Um, were you able to review the PenFed accounts at any time? Yes. Do you recall any what was any money in those accounts? For the most of the time, I reviewed uh, a little bit over a year. I believe most of the time it had five dollars in it. Okay. Um, right. I have no further questions, Your I'm going to be really quick because I'm going to pretend that's the LDS that I don't think it's Well, they, uh, this takes what it takes. Okay. Uh, they're, they're on notice that I'm uh, otherwise engaged now. Okay. I need it now. <laughs> uh, Ms. Carrington, a couple of questions. Um, I want to talk about, pursuant to your testimony, you've been doing this for a long time. Yes. Um, and you look at investment. Uh, type businesses as well as personal finances, correct? As, That's as correct. the course of your uh, review of things. And you said that she, Corey Richens Realty was essentially flipping homes, correct? As, as that, a business. That's my understanding from what's publicly available. Yeah. And uh, in your experience, that type of a business model um, is essentially that you don't own very long and then you resale, correct? Yes. So within the framework of that, it would not be uncommon or uncharacteristic to have these hard money lenders as a part of that type of business model, correct? Yes, and, th and that I did say earlier okay. that that's typical. Yes. Right, we wouldn't go get conventional home loans for a home we're going to own for, you know, six months, we hope, correct? You could. That would be a lot lower interest rate. Even though it had a, a longer repayment period, someone could get a conventional loan to do that. It would be hard to continue to get conventional loans, I would assume, when you're buying multiple properties, correct? I, I don't know the answer to that. What I will say is it's very typical for someone in this industry that Ms. Richens is in to get hard money lenders. So what she was doing was typical for the industry? I would say yes. Okay. Um, and you created this... Um, schedule of homes. Um, did you also look at when those homes sold? Yes, I did. Okay. And did you correlate those uh, payments? Correlate. Like, were you able to see what the homes sold for? I have been able to see many of them what they sold for. Okay. So, <clears throat> and then if you look at those... She only still owns a handful of those, correct? Like four, maybe five. I'm sorry, what? She only time she period? only still currently owns um, just a, a small handful of those homes, correct? I think she still owns about six or eight. So she owns the ones on Canyons Resort Drive that are rental properties. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and she uh, owns the Saratoga Springs house. Yes. Okay. And. Um, she, 
the she still owns the condo in B Street in Salt Lake City. Correct, in the Heber City. Yes, she does. It's it's under joint tenancy, okay. and she, her, J, K. Richens Realty is still on the title on that. And were you able to see on any of these um, hard money loans if she'd partnered with anyone on them? And it's not just a hard money loan, but if there were any partnership. Uh, the trust deeds did not indicate a partnership. Okay, so you wouldn't know if there was some other partnership that existed on Yes, that would be reflected in the trust deed, and, and I did not see any partnership on any of them. Okay. Um, um, were you able to see um, what the, the balance in the 2204 account as part of your review of? At what time period? It, it, at any time period. Did you look at the 2204 I did. account yes. as well? Okay. Yes. And although there were, there were fluctuations in her business account, that account uh, always had sufficient funds in it, correct? That's not correct. Okay. There was a period of time where it did not. There are periods of time, okay. yes. And uh, you also said that um, Eric was on this 5244 account that was being used for essentially business uh, type. That was Corey's business, not Eric's. Is that correct? You're asking me a couple of things. Okay, sorry, He's, I'll slow down. He's that's on okay. The no, it's fine. It's fine. He's on the signature card. Okay. So when an account is opened, he signed as an authorized signer, she signed as an authorized signer. Okay. As so I, he would have, as an authorized signer, he would have access if he wanted to go review what that account was doing, correct? Not necessarily. Okay. That all depends on how it's set up with um, the online access. Just because someone's an authorized signer doesn't mean that they can come in and walk into the bank and get okay. any information they want. Were you, and it, were you able to tell in this case? Well, as I said, the bank statement does not say Eric and Corey Richens. It says Corey Richens. And so, and looking at the transactions in the account before I looked at the signature card, it it looked very much like a business account that Corey would have. Okay. And are you aware that Eric was he was in the stonemasonry business, correct? That's correct. Okay. And so he was on some level assisting her in the remodel or. or clean up some of these homes, correct? That is not how I would term it. My, I'm, not, I'm not saying financially. Are you aware that he was doing work on these homes? I'm aware, for instance, on the France and Lane home in which he and Cody um, contributed about $133,000 um, toward the completion of the home, and my understanding is different than okay. how you're portraying. Okay. Before we rest, we would have asked that this be marked uh, as states exhibit. Two has not been. Uh, no, and then, well, we would, uh, I think she was just using that as a demonstrative. Thing. Okay, so that's fine. We would ask that this be marked as states exhibit three. This is a transcript of the jail call from uh, May 8th. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brittany, we put three on that. Ms. Lazaro, any objection to admission of States Exhibit 3 solely for the purpose of this detention hearing? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, only to the extent that I have not been provided a copy of any of the jail phone calls that I could find last night when I was searching. Do you have any of the audio? Uh, no, that have been provided in discovery. So. All right. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> well. So I, I guess, know, out of yes, fundamental I fairness for 
the defendant and without having to address the need to postpone or continue this detention hearing, I am not going to consider that phone call. State's Exhibit 1 is in. State's Exhibit 3, for the purposes of the de this detention hearing, is not. Okay. Okay. And, Your Honor, we have no further witnesses. However, we do have a victim impact statement from, from the victim representative. And if you could just name that person for That's us. That's Amy Richards. Amy, if you don't mind stepping forward to the podium. Good morning. Go ahead. Dear Judge Mrazek, I'm here today to represent my brother, Eric Eugene Richens, whose life was taken in a senseless act of poisoning on March 3rd, 2022. His wife, the defendant, has been accused of committing this crime. If she is found guilty, she has committed the ultimate act of betrayal. Eric is gone and I am brokenhearted. He was my best friend and protector. The feeling of loss is so great it is visceral. And with the sorrow comes wave of panic at not being able to see him again. I can never talk to him, never hug him again, and never more be a part of his life. Eric's world revolved around his family, his love for hunting, the family cattle ranch, and his intense drive as a successful entrepreneur. Being born into the Richens legacy shaped Eric's formative years and resulted in a lifetime of hard work, dedication, and fierce loyalty. At an early age, Eric learned the joys of keeping horses and cows around. He spent countless hours worked the ranch, hauling hay, feeding the animals, and mending fences. He loved our family unconditionally and was a devoted son, brother, uncle, and father. Eric was a family man who always strove to be the absolute best father and husband. He was an attentive and loving father to his three sons and a devoted husband to his wife of almost nine years, Corey, the defendant. Eric did absolutely everything in his power to provide his family and his three sons with every possible to grow and have fun. He was the coach or assistant coach on all his boys' teams, which included soccer, basketball, and baseball, he spent countless hours coaching and teaching the boys to play aggressive and give it their all. Eric truly cared about every single child he coached and wanted the absolute best for all of them. There was never a dull moment when you were around Eric, whether it was him showing up to a family dinner with no socks or because he had to make an emergency bathroom stop along the way, or his calling to tell you he rolled the four-wheeler for the upteenth time is stuck and he needs you to come get him. It was never boring. Eric loved to have fun and always wanted to make sure everyone else did as well. He owned almost every motorized toy possible, from four-wheelers and side-by-sides to trucks and snowmobiles, and was so excited to share those with his sons. He had the perfect combination of business sense and foresight. He built a very successful masonry business from the ground up and helped many friends do the same. He had a special ability to build close relationships with everyone he worked with, which really allowed his business to thrive. Eric loved every aspect of his job, but most of all, he loved the people he worked for. Eric faithfully supported organizations that he truly believed in. He never was one that wanted recognition or accolades. He did most things anonymously and without recognition. Eric was a true champion of all. It did not matter if you were an employee, friend, family, or the next random person walking down the street. If you needed anything, you could count on him. He truly cared about each person he met. Eric loved fully, laughed loudly, and lived life with He enjoyed great adventures to far off places, but also cherished the small and finer things in life. No obstacle was too great for Eric. He simply viewed each one as a challenge. No peak was too high, and the next adventure was always just around the next bend. Words cannot describe the loneliness and loss that is felt in every heart that was lucky enough to know him. Eric was such an inspiration and role model for us all. His loss has created a Grand Canyon-sized hole in this community. Except instead of taking millions of years to slowly form, our worlds change open overnight. His three boys' entire worlds and their perspectives on life changed. None of our lives will ever be the same.
Eric died under horrendous circumstances. I am tormented at the thought of what he endured. I play it out in my mind. I go through the terrible sequence of events. I wonder when he realized he was in mortal danger. What he may have said to him in his last moments. How long was he conscious, knowing he would die? Where were Eric? Did they hear Eric's body fall to the ground? Did they catch a glimpse of their father taking his last breath? It's torture to think of. Why did Eric lose his life? Why did the boys lose their father? Was it because of Corey's greed and desire to get life insurance and other assets? If so, that is abhorrent. How could anyone value human life so cheaply? I cannot comprehend it. I'm overflowing with grief and, grief and pain at the thought that Eric meant so little to her. If Eric had died because of an illness, he would have been cared for. He could have looked after him and been with him. If he had died because of an accident, people would have tried to help. There would have been kindness. But there's no to be had here. There's no concern. In his last moments, after being intentionally poisoned, he was faced with betrayal and terror. The thought of it is unbearable. I am haunted by the horror of it. It has been a living hell for our family. We have watched as Corey has paraded around portraying herself as a grieving window, widow and victim while trying to profit from the death of my brother. Both by trying to profit from a book about his death and trying to get life insurance and ask that should go exactly where Eric wanted them to, to his voice. Immediately after he was killed, Corey told us she could not help us get anything ready for the funeral as she was too distraught with grief. We shortly found out that was not true at all. In fact, she pulled herself off to go close on the purchase of a $2 million home, hire a real estate agent, hire an architect to create CAD drawings of the home, hire a lawyer in order to file a lawsuit on Eric's trust, hire a locksmith to come break into and clean out my brother's safe, and attempt to have Eric cremated. She mustered up the strength and resolve to do most of this within 48 hours of his death. Corey assaulted me. I will never forget the look in her eyes when she attacked me that Sunday morning. It was early and had been snowing most of the night. I was just getting ready to leave and heading out to the car when I saw a locksmith in Eric's detached garage starting to drill out his gun safe. I asked Corey multiple times why we could not just call my dad for the code. I could not understand why she was breaking into and ruining Eric's safe. To this, she screamed at me at the top of her lungs, called me some inappropriate things I cannot share with you here, and then told me to get out of her house. It was then that I told her that she could not kick me out of my brother's house. My sister Katie was now the executor of Eric's trust and estate, and just like Eric, she would not want the defendant breaking into his gun safe. Corey looked at me with pure hatred and rage. I was messing up her plan. I was getting in her way. And because of that, she attacked me. Multiple times. It took four people to pull her off me that day. Before the funeral, funeral Corey opened a bank account and asked everyone that was grieving to send her money instead of sending the family cards and flowers two weeks after Eric's passing that we were told she had taken down my brother and removed all his clothing from the house. Corey put together a golf tournament in Eric's name two months after his death on what would have been his 40th birthday and told his family, all of us, that we were not allowed to attend. Since Eric's death, it has come to our attention that Corey took out multiple life insurance policies on Eric without his knowledge. It appears that she forged his signature on various documents, assigned herself as Eric's durable power of attorney, inappropriately diverted money from his business to herself, and assigned herself as beneficiary of Eric's portion of our mother's retirement account. I should also no not forget to mention the multiple life insurances she has taken out on the boys. Her most recent business venture was authoring a children's book about how to help grieving children cope with the loss of 
the death of a parent. In this book, she had the audacity to use the boys' real names and even use their last family portrait. Her behavior gives me great concern as she has exploited the boys for money and will likely do so again. In addition, Corey has weaponized Eric's children, manipulating my dad to do or not do things by threatening to, come him, to cut him out of their lives if he, did, if he did not capitulate to her demands. She similarly deprived the boys of contact with myself, my sister, and her daughters unless we agreed to give her the money in Eric's trust money that Eric wanted to go to his three children. As if that were not enough, I have been told that Corey started telling their three little boys that none of Eric's family or friends loved them. She apparently told them none of us cared for them or wanted to be around them, even though that is the exact opposite of what was happening. We all want nothing more than to be there for those three little boys, my nephews, yet Corey has made sure to cut us out of every aspect of their lives. This is all just a brief summary and the start of what our family has been through over the last year. We have scarcely gone a day without finding out some new allegations or evidence regarding something Corey appears to have maliciously done to attack and undermine my brother, his three little boys, and our family. We have all been there since the beginning of Corey's and Eric's relationship. I was there on one of their first dates. We were there at the wedding. We were there when each of the boys were born. We have been there for every birthday party, school graduation, and rodeo. We welcomed her into our family and treated her as one of us. Not only did she betray our brother, it feels as though she has murdered and taken away a part of our souls as well. Because of her actions, there has not been a day that has gone by we have not lived with paralyzing anxiety and fear, worrying for the boys' lives as well as our own. I may be naive, but I never knew evil like this existed. I was in fact willing to kill Eric for money. Who's to say that sh what she will not do? Who would be next? Corey was in a desperate financial situation when Eric was killed, and that situation seems even worse now. We understand that she has defaulted on loans and is already a defendant in other lawsuits based on her financial misdeeds. I am truly concerned that she will stop at nothing to dig her way out of the problems, including murder. She seems devoid of moral sensibility, and there is no telling what she will do if she is released. Judge Mrazik, her fate lies in your hands. Please do not allow Corey to use the fraudulent life insurance proceeds to get out on bail. That would be morally reprehensible. Please do not allow Corey to take advantage and make a mockery of our justice and legal system anymore. She has done enough. Please do not allow Corey to hurt Eric's memory, our family, friends, and community anymore. We have been through enough. Please do not give Corey the opportunity to hurt Eric's three boys anymore. They have lost enough and have been through enough. Since Eric's death, we have learned and unfortunately are continually reminded that Corey is desperate, greedy, and extremely manipulative. Out on bail, I will be afraid not only for my own life, and those of all of my family, but most for the lives of Eric's three sons. He has already suffered enough. Please do not let Corey out on bail where she will be a risk to do further harm. Please protect what Eric put his life on the line for, his three boys. Thank you. Maybe. Thank you. Ms. Cassell. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lazaro, is the defense calling any witnesses? I am not. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is just largely have the court review the briefing and the attached exhibits be submitted and considered as part of this, but I don't intend to put on any uh, further evidence. All right. Uh, would you like an opportunity to make any closing argument for today, Ms. Lazaro? Yes. Why don't we have defense go first, and we'll just give the state the last word. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, I guess I'd start with whether or not the court has any specific issues they would like me to address. No, I mean, candidly, there's there's a threshold legal issue here, right, that comes out of the briefing, and the state has been candid about the pending 
Barnett case. I listened to the oral arguments. I think the state is wise to request a ruling in the alternative, but I'm persuaded by the defendant's position that as a matter of law, while a defendant charged with a capital felony supported by substantial evidence does not have a right, they can nonetheless request bail and the district court retains discretion, at least under the current status of the Utah Code, to consider the request. So fast forward past that. I will do so. And um, don't necessarily disagree with what may or may come out of that case that's up on appeal. Right. Uh, with regard to the sufficiency of the evidence, um, I mean, we're, we're here because of a really tragic circumstance, and I don't think any of us want to forget that. I mean, especially my client. She loved her kids. She loved her husband. Um, but she's also charged now with his murder. Um, and so I just don't necessarily want that to get lost on the court that we understand the gravity of the situation. Um, with regard to the evidence, I, I'm going to skip through most of it. I think the most important thing, if she poisoned him, is did she ever get it from was it ever requested from CL? I don't think the state has been able to draw that nexus. I don't disagree that CL was buying drugs. I think that's clear. Um, she has a history of being a drug distributor. She was jammed in first degree felonies. She had a potential federal case hanging over. Her. And you know, then when they look at her phone, they find evidence of additional drug distribution. We knew charge. Uh, pursuant to essentially the detective's testimony is they walked her down the line of I need more evidence this is what we need to know and, and provided evidence to her essentially until she got it right and then she was released uh, when we look at the cell phone mapping um, yes we know she went and picked up a check we know that she was cleaning houses we know she cashed a check we know she picked up drugs, but they can't put her anywhere in the same vicinity of Corey's phone. Because apparently the mapping's not available from Verizon, which somewhat surprises me, given it's Verizon. I think it's a length but, of time between the events and the request. Correct. Um, but they don't, they have cross things about her, her buying and selling fentanyl. They have zero corroborating evidence for anything Corey for giving it to Corey. She didn't tell anybody that she was buying it for Corey. She uh, never had anybody with her when she dropped it off. Uh, there's, there's nothing to make the most important correlation in this, and that's that it was ever provided to Corey that there was no fentanyl or traces of fentanyl found in the home anywhere. Um, and I think that's significant. I think if she had gotten 30 pills on at least two separate occasions, that's a lot of fentanyl. I mean, if, one, if, if one's lethal, right, we're talking about a lot of fentanyl and nothing is found, no traces anywhere, absolutely nothing. So. I, I think the state's making a big leap in their evidence by saying, look, we, we have this girl, we know, she's, we know she's a drug dealer, we know she's buying fentanyl, uh, but there's nothing to corroborate anything she says that ties it to Corey. Um, the glass, you know, Corey tells them she made him a drink, right? The glass is there. No one, no one thinks to bother to, to... Where's the evidence that the glass is present? didn't look for a glass, I guess is what I should say. Okay. So no glass was tested. So there's nothing to show that Corey did anything to Eric. Detective O'Driscoll's testimony, it could have been accidental. I mean, it very well could have. And I think that given the evidence presented today is a very plausible situation. With money does not make you a murderer. Being, being bad at it, Managing your accounts just, I mean, makes you makes you bad at math, but it doesn't make you a murderer. The other thing I think that's significant is if 
the, by the testimony that came out today, the hard money loans that she owed, at least, far exceeded life insurance policy. And so even getting the life insurance money was not going to solve Corey's problems, not even close to solving her problems. Uh, and so that evidence alone, while, you know, maybe there's some other issues uh, with Corey's business, uh, there's nothing to tie it uh, to her having any motive or in any way being in a better position from Eric's death. In fact, she's in a worse position because of his death because Eric had a business. He was continually making money. You know, he was, you know, from what it sounds like, the, the majority of the contributions into the joint account. So his death, from a financial perspective, has harmed her far more than any money that she gained from any life insurance. Um, that um, I'll largely submit on the remainder of our briefing, as I trust the court is. I have, carefully. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Cassell. Thank you, Your Honor. With respect to the no corroborating evidence, there's, there's a, a lot of corroborating evidence that corroborates CL's statements. She, it, it's, and, 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 and I think one of the things that we have that, that's said is, you know, she, that she was, she was primed and, 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 and told to, uh, told what to say. But, but what really happened is she's, you know, a year later, she's asked to consider what, you know, if she remembered anything else, and she came back with, yeah, I remember more, I remember more. And that's very typical of, of witnesses. It's typical of people that we have testify. And then just the, I mean, you heard all of the corroborating evidence, Your Honor, the matching with the cell phone, with the mapping. Uh, do we have the, the uh, uh, her put, CL putting the, the drug in, uh, in, in uh, Corey's hands? We do. We have a hand to hand that that uh, that uh, was testified to. So we have the evidence that that, uh, that's, that Corey got or the defendant got the drugs. We also have the evidence that corroborates all or most of CL's story. It, we would have more if there weren't uh, texts uh, that were deleted. We have a, a great deal of information that was deleted, and that was deleted off of the defendant's phone. Uh, and, so I think that that uh, is sufficient evidence just for, for uh, CL and that makes CL credible. Um, the idea that no glass was tested, well, if you look at the pictures that we have uh, submitted, there's nothing there. It's a stage scene. How, how they can argue that, that Eric somehow consumed this himself, there's no glass, there's no baggies, there's nothing that this was ever, ever taken by Eric. And also to say it's accidental, uh, one or two pills might be accidental. 20 or five times the lethal dose is not accidental, Your Honor. That is a, that, that is someone who, who wants Eric dead. And the person who benefited the most from Eric being dead is the defendant. Or the person who thought she was going to benefit the most from Eric being dead is the defendant. She thought she was going to be entitled to Eric's estate. She didn't know that there was this trust that had put the money into into uh, Katie Richens thought on the day that Eric died that she was the one that was going to benefit. She benefited from the insurance policies. She thought she was going to benefit from more. And she uh, thought she was going to benefit from Eric's estate. She tried to benefit from the other uh, uh, life insurance policy on Eric's uh, business. Didn't, that didn't happen. She also was in dire financial straits, Your Honor, writing checks on closed accounts or checks with, with no money in them. I know you cut me off. It was because, in your brief. I got right, it. I, I, thank you. I understand. But uh, that's significant because she was in dire financial straits. She was, she was, she was uh, deep in debt. And the way to get out of that debt was to kill Eric Richens. She benefited financially, and she had a, many cases, and we talk about this all the time. Prosecutors say we don't need motive. This case has motive. This case has motive that she... Uh, needed to get out of this debt, and that's the reason she killed Eric, in hopes of getting his estate, in hopes of getting his, his life insurance policies. 
And that's and that, Your Honor, we believe is substantial evidence. All right. issue before the court is whether defendant Corey Richens should continue to be held without bail during the pretrial period. Defendant is charged, among other crimes, with aggravated murder under Utah Code 76-5202 sub 2. To convict defendant of this charge, must prove beyond a reasonable doubt at trial intentionally or knowingly caused the death of another individual under any one of the following circumstances for pecuniary gain or by means of the administration of a poison or of any lethal substance under article 1 section 8 of the Utah Constitution a defendant charged with a capital offense has no right to bail if there is no evidence to support the capital charge and under Utah Code 7720-201 sub 3, a charge of aggravated murder is considered a capital felony for the purposes of determining bail during the period before the state makes an a notice of intent to seek the death penalty. Accordingly, at this time, the aggravated murder charge in this case is considered a capital felony. Moving to the substantial evidence inquiry, consider the evidence offered by the parties, both through live testimony today and by documents attached to their briefs, which the court has reviewed at length, and having had the opportunity to weigh the credibility of that evidence. The court determines the state's evidence, notwithstanding contradictions, evidence could support a reasonable jury reaching a guilty verdict on the charge of aggravated murder. Indeed, a jury could reasonably choose to rely on the state's evidence regarding means and motive and consciousness of guilt, which includes evidence showing that Eric Richens died of fentanyl ingestion, that he was not known to be a user of illicit drugs other than the occasional that defendant purchased 15 to 30 fentanyl pills from CL approximately one month prior to uh, Eric Richens' death. Cell phone mapping confirms or at least indicates to a reasonable jury that CL's phone was near the Maverick and Draper on February 11th and that while there, CL's phone made calls to acquaintances capital A acquaintances as listed in the testimony and the information and sent texts to defendant Corey Richens and that CL's phone then uh, traveled to Francis and then returned, pardon, was in Francis and then returned to Heber. CL sworn testimony that she handed the fentanyl that she acquired to uh, Corey Richens in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction in her driveway. We also have motive. At the time of Eric's death, defendant knew how the premarital agreement would operate, but was not aware that Eric had changed his estate plan. So at the time of Eric's death, defendant's subjective understanding was that she would get a greater share of the marital estate if Eric died during the marriage as opposed to what she would receive under the premarital agreement if the parties divorced. Moreover, evidence uh, admitted in the case shows that in the months leading to Eric's death, defendant's personal and business accounts were overdrawn. She was making significant recurring debt payments, many of which were to hard money lenders, and that her lines of credit or lines of credit, credit available to her were maxed out. And at the time of his death, Eric's life was insured for approximately $1.2 million, not including the policy related to the buy-sell agreement, with defendant listed as the beneficiary. 
Moreover, we have evidence from which a jury could reasonably infer consciousness of guilt. We have evidence regarding the search uh, that was extracted from defendant's second phone after her first phone was seized. And then we have inconsistent uh, made by defendant as compared to other evidence in the case regarding whether she called 911 immediately whether she performed CPR, whether she did something else for the 15 minutes between discovering uh, Eric dead and calling 911. In considering this evidence, a jury could reasonably choose to discount and find unpersuasive defendants' efforts to poke holes in the state's case, and in so doing, a reasonable jury could reach a verdict of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt on the charge of aggravated murder based on the state's evidence. For these reasons, there is substantial evidence to support the capital felony charge of aggravated murder against the defendant in this case. Having made that determination, the court considers whether it has discretion to grant defendant bail, notwithstanding that she has no right to bail under Article I, Section 8 of the Utah Constitution. And having considered the arguments uh, and authorities cited in the party's briefing, the court determines as a matter of law that in the case of a capital felony that is supported by substantial evidence, while a defendant does not have a right to bail, the defendant may nonetheless still request bail, and the district court has discretion to grant bail if the circumstances warrant doing so. But the circumstances of this case weigh soundly against granting pretrial release of any kind. First, defendant is charged as the death penalty and no less severe than the indeterminate prison term of 25 years to life. Of those sanctions, the severity of the sanctions conviction for aggravated murder creates a powerful incentive for a defendant to resort to desperate acts that might include harming themselves, harming the members of their family, or harming witnesses in the case. Because an incentive this powerful cannot be adequately managed in the community, it weighs heavily against granting any form of pretrial release. Second, the state has offered substantial evidence that defendant procured fentanyl on more than one occasion, and on at least one occasion deployed that fentanyl to cause the death of another person. As a general matter, an individual who is capable of this kind of decision making is not a good candidate for supervision in the community. More specifically, given the uniquely dangerous nature of fentanyl, which has been demonstrated tragically by events in Summit County, defendant's alleged conduct, as supported by substantial evidence, is especially dangerous. Indeed, these circumstances constitute clear and convincing evidence that defendant would pose a substantial danger to the community if released on bail, a substantial danger that cannot be adequately managed by any combination of conditions of pretrial release that are available in Summit County. For these reasons, the court finds the circumstances of this case, as supported by substantial evidence, weigh soundly against any form of pretrial release. The state's motion for pension is granted. Defendant Corey Darden Richens shall continue to be detained without during the time she awaits trial or other resolution of the criminal charges against her. Ms. Richens, you have the right to an expedited appeal of the you must file a notice of appeal within 30 days of the court's ruling, and you have the right to be represented by counsel on that appeal. Let's pause there for a moment. Ms. Cassell, any questions? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Lozara. No, Your Honor. Thank you. Where do we go from Are you prepared to set a preliminary? I don't think so, because I think just based on the state's briefing and evidence provided, there's a lot of stuff that I don't have yet. 
and probably need experts to look at, especially with regard to the phones. Okay. Uh, what is a reasonable time to set a scheduling conference, understanding that I'm going to push counsel to move this case as fast as possible, given that Ms. Richens is in custody? I understand that and appreciate it. I, I guess that question should be posed to the state as to when they think they can get me things. Like, I can't prepare with, without the evidence. I'm, that, I'm at their mercy at this point. Can we check in on the 26th? Whether you think you've received everything? I will, yes. Uh, do you want to do it in the morning or the afternoon? Uh, let me look. 26th of June? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm looking at the wrong. I'm, I'm sorry. That's a Monday, Your Honor. You're right. You know what, though? That's probably okay. Let me take a look here, folks. One second. What's that? You're right. That's not going to work. Okay. Um, we can go to the 23rd, Your Honor. We can. Can you get stuff turned around that quickly, Ms. Cassell? Well, we, we. You believe you've given it all? We we have. Yeah, okay. we have everything that, 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 that we have, we put in our. Uh, June 23, Ms. Lazara? Um, I'm out of town as long as I can appear via WebEx. It's fine. And I I don't know that we need Ms. Richens if we're just going to set it as a... And she has a right. Yeah. She doesn't have to be in the courtroom if she doesn't want to be. Um, we do it the 30th instead then, so I can... We can't. I'll be out of town. You want to go to the 7th? We can also special set it. Um, what other? What, I'm sorry. What else do you have? No, it's fine. Um, do you want to do midday on the 22nd? Uh, yes. Ms. Cassell. That's fine. All right. Noon. On June 2 for a scheduling conference. Would you like that to be by WebEx, Ms. Lazar? You can come in person. All right. That's fine. Very good. June 22 at noon in here in courtroom B. Ms. Lazaro, anything else on the record today? No, I don't have anything further. Thank you. Ms. Cassell. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do this in a fashion. And we're going to do it in stages. I appreciate your patience. Just listen to the deputies. Everybody in front of the bar, sit tight. The deputies are going to clear the gallery one section at a time first. Please just sit quietly and let them do their job. Thank you. Your Honor, do you mind if Ms. Uh, uh, Crossland goes with the... That's Thank you. Otherwise... The court is in recess. I appreciate your patience this morning. Ms. Richens, I wish you the best of luck on 22nd. Thank you.